One. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Fernandez, your vice chair of the select board um, in today for Heather Hamilton. This is our select board meeting for Tuesday, April 26, um, 2022. Uh, we've got a lot of ground uh, to cover tonight. Uh, we also have um, a special guest joining us uh, who we'll hear from in just a moment, uh, and that is Congressman Jake Auchincloss. Um, he was invited uh, by my colleague, John Van Square. Um, to join our board meeting and uh, provide an update on um, on what the situation in Ukraine uh, and other issues as well. Um, so um, just wanted to welcome uh, our Congressman, Congressman Jake Auchincloss. Thank you, Vice Chairman. And I appreciate the invitation from the Brookline Select Board to address you and the constituents of Brookline about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Vice Chairman, do you want me to proceed or are there other items of business to attend to? No, please go right ahead. We want to make sure we make the best use of your time. Great. Uh, we have all seen the images and reports coming out of Ukraine in the last days and weeks, and they attest to war crimes being committed, and they attest to a barbaric war machine that is violating human rights at every turn. Uh, Vladimir Putin needs to be defeated. It must be uh, the policy of this administration and the bipartisan will of Congress that we are not simply seeking to provide President Zelensky the upper hand at the negotiating table. We are not simply seeking to uh, drain Russian forces as they invade their neighbor. We are seeking the defeat of Russia in its unprovoked, unjust invasion of Ukraine. Uh, it is clearly primarily about the peace and safety of the Ukrainian people and their rights to uh, fulfill their aspirations and to live peaceably. Uh, but it's also about upholding the post-war international order that the United States, along with our allies and NATO and elsewhere, helped architect after World War II. A post-war order that, although far from perfect, although far from just, uh, did advance peace and prosperity the world over, 
uh, and did attempt to uphold an architecture in which might does not make right. And nations big and small uh, have the right to self-determination. We need to win in Ukraine, put simply. So I will uh, provide an update first on the situation in Ukraine and second on what the United States is doing about it. So first, the situation in Ukraine. Starting on April 19th, it moved into a second phase. Initially, Russia had clearly see, sought to decapitate the government in Kiev. They had attempted to strike rapidly at the capital region in Ukraine and uh, within a matter of days had expected to be able to install a puppet regime and that failed catastrophically. Uh, they severely underestimated the extent to which the Ukrainian military since 2014 had been better equipped and better trained. Uh, they overestimated their own logistics, command and control and morale of Russian forces. And uh, following the failure of their attempts to take the capital, had to regroup and refit. Their new mission is to take Eastern and Southern Ukraine such that they can landlock the country, uh, gaining some of the most uh, economically productive areas of Ukraine uh, in the South in particular that have access to warm water uh, and ports. Also areas that have large Russian speaking populations that in 2014 uh, were 30 to 50% potentially sympathetic to Russia, now much, much lower than that. And so the battle for the East has begun. And from a military perspective, I think the key thing to note about the difference between the battle for the capital and the battle for the East is that we're, we're changing from a war of maneuver to a war of attrition. And the respective vulnerabilities and supply chains are, are shifting thereby. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in a war of maneuver, mobility and speed are key. You're attempting to move faster than your enemy. You're attempting to strike at their weaknesses. You're attempting to disrupt command and control. We saw that with the Russian uh, airborne troops attempting to take the airport near Kiev to decapitate the government and to uh, sow chaos and confusion within Ukrainian elite. Uh, and then you saw that in effective form from Ukrainian resistance that was moving fast, oftentimes at night actually, and striking at uh, Russian units that had been demobilized uh, by poor logistics, even sometimes even lack of fuel. That was a war of mobility. Uh, a more maneuver, excuse me, where mobility and speed were key. What's happening now in the East is going to look much more like a war of attrition in which uh, it's more about firepower and less about maneuver. It's less about speed and mobility and more about um, clearer battle lines and the ability for massed formations to, uh, to degrade each other's firepower. Um, and the challenge here for the Ukraine and West is that the supply chain advantages have shifted a little bit. When Russia was trying to go after the capital, they had very stretched supply chains. They were coming in from the north, uh, from Belarus. They were coming in from the east, from, from Russia itself. And their supply chains were quite long and were quite vulnerable. And Ukrainian forces, with significant support from the United States and the West, took advantage of that. That has changed a little bit. Now we have seen that because they're targeting the East where they've been active since 2014, that the Russians have much shorter supply chains. They're less vulnerable thereby. They are better oiled. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not vulnerable and that they are working perfectly. They're, they're very much so not. And we're still seeing that they have these long stretched out convoys, but they are compressed and they are uh, able to refit those troops more easily. By contrast, the Ukrainian forces now are having to pull in Western armaments and materiel uh, farther. And as we saw today, the Russians are using precision missiles to strike at these supply depots and these supply chains coming in from the West. Uh, and uh, that is, a, that is a, a new development. This is unlikely to uh, foundationally change the character of the war, however, partly because the Russians just don't have very many of these precision guided missiles to strike at supply chains. They probably use 70 to 80% of what they have already. Uh, and partly because uh, the West rightfully <clears throat> is going to continue to provide these armaments and material to Ukraine uh, in capricious, uh, excuse me, in capacious quantities. Uh, and 
it does not seem at this point like Russia is willing to take the risk of firing uh, into NATO controlled territory, into NATO territory to disrupt supply chains further. That would be a, a significant escalation, one I do not expect Russia would undertake. So although the supply chain fight in the war of attrition is, is ongoing, and although it's moved somewhat to Russia's advantage, I don't expect it to be uh, a transformative advantage. Right now, the Ukrainians really need three things in abundance. Uh, they need firepower, they need willpower, uh, and they need um, targeting support. And on that first front, the Biden administration has unleashed billions of dollars in materiel and armaments aid to Ukraine, everything from drones, counter drones, javelins and stingers for anti-tank and anti-air, personal protective equipment, ammunition, uh, aircraft, long range, uh, long range surface to air and uh, surface to surface capabilities. Uh, and we'll continue to provide whatever the Ukrainians need and can use and our NATO allies are doing likewise, including Germany, uh, which has stepped up in a way that would have been hard to imagine a year ago in their provisioning of equipment to a, a, another country. Uh, just this week, we're gonna approve the Ukrainian Lend-Lease Act, which will be the first time since World War II in our use of Lend-Lease to support Great Britain that we have invoked this capacity. It is expediting and streamlining a program that frankly the president really already can use, which is his drawdown capacity where he can basically take American weapon stocks and send them to Ukraine. We are basically making it even easier for him to do that. And it's a demonstration of congressional support, further congressional support uh, for arming the Ukrainians. Um, Related to firepower is targeting support. I think this has been underreported uh, in, in coverage of the war. Uh, in modern warfare, figuring out exactly how you're going to hit what you want to hit is really hard. And there's a very sophisticated array of defense mechanisms that you've got to bypass. And it's something the United States is very good at from a military perspective. We do not have and, and are unlikely to have boots on the ground in Ukraine. The president's been very clear about that. But we can, through intelligence and paramilitary support from NATO allies on the border with Ukraine, provide pretty significant targeting support to the Ukrainians to help them use the weapons we're giving them to hit at key Russian sources of strength, whether they're command and control nodes, whether they're logistics depots, or whether they are actually mass formations of either tank uh, or infantry. So we're going to continue to provide both the firepower and the targeting support. The willpower, of course, uh, is, is of critical import in, in a war of attrition, one that regrettably is likely to become even more savage in the month ahead as, as President Putin has, a, has appointed the butcher of Syria to be his commanding general. And as he is becoming um, uh, in, increasingly unmoored clearly from his close circle of advisors. And this is why I feel so strongly that Congress and the administration need to make clear that not only are we going to provide firepower and targeting support to Ukraine, not only are we going to isolate and undermine Russia on the world stage economically and diplomatically, uh, but that we have a clear policy objective as a nation that Russia must fail in Ukraine. Uh, that has not been stated unequivocally, and I, and I do believe it needs to be, uh, that we are here with Ukraine now, we are here with them later, and we are here with them for the long term uh, as they seek to rebuild their economy and society uh, as they seek to strengthen their democracy and their sovereignty uh, after uh, ejecting uh, this unjust invasion. Uh, and, and we need to continue to assert that and make clear that we are here for Ukraine and the cause of the free world. The final point I'll address is on actions that we can take to undermine and isolate Russia on the world stage. I think many of our constituents are familiar with uh, sanctions that we have imposed on Russia, on uh, actions taken voluntarily in the private sector to disengage from Russia. I'll highlight the two that I think are, are really the most impactful and that need to be strengthened and that even need to be expanded. The first is central bank sanctions on Russia. The central bank sanctions were unexpected by the Kremlin and they are really the jewel in the crown of the financial services sanctions and I would say actually any of the sanctions that we have imposed on the Kremlin because they took about $600 billion worth of hard currency reserves and rendered at least half and, and maybe up to two thirds of it inoperable. And that was not in the Kremlin's game plan. They thought they were gonna have access to that. 
They thought they were going to be able to use that to buffer their economy from the effects of sanctions, which, which they were predicting. And without access to that hard currency reserves, um, they have really been unable to put a floor under the drop in standards of living of their constituents and have been unable to uh, address inflation um, and goods shortages without some pretty extreme measures like capital controls and uh, suspending trading. So these central bank sanctions are absolutely critical and the, and the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and the Deputy Secretary Wally Adeomo deserve tremendous credit for, for putting in place something um, kind of covertly that had such a tremendous impact. Uh, the, the, the key with the central bank sanctions though is that you only get to do them once because once they get lifted, the Russians will immediately take their hard currency out of US controlled uh, or US influenced depository institutions and then you'll never be able to levy them again. And so I know the Treasury Department is, is working carefully and in consultation with the Financial Services Committee on which I sit to figure out how do you calibrate um, central bank sanctions relief uh, if and when the, the Russians are ejected from Ukraine so that we retain that leverage because that's been a tremendous tool that we don't want to lose. Uh, the second one is, is oil. Uh, and I, I just can't stress this one enough. Since the beginning of this invasion, I have called for the administration to impose a energy blockade of Russia. Russia exports three different types of energy in, in great quantity, coal, gas, and oil. Uh, coal and gas are significant sources of, of currency for the Russians, and gas in particular has outsized importance for its relationship with Europe and Europe's dependence on Russia. But in terms of actual dollar amounts, neither of them compare to oil. Oil is, is the critical Russian export. It is how it's funding its war machine. And it's with great frustration that I say that they're still making a lot of money from oil in 2022. Uh, the prices have gone up. And although they are uh, facing sanctions from the United States and Canada directly and from some self-sanctioning by global oil importers elsewhere, uh, the higher prices have mostly made up for the lack of, of volume that they're shipping. And the United States needs to use secondary sanctions, which the president already has authority to do, to prevent other oil importers the world over from providing succor to, to the Russians. Uh, and we can do so in a way that does not cause a massive energy shock. And I can, you know, I'm happy to go into the details of how to do that, but what it comes down to is that the oil, the global oil market is not as liquid and fungible as it's made out to be. It's not like if one person says no, you can immediately provide the oil to somebody else if you're, if you're Russia. Their uh, oil production and distribution system is much less flexible than that. Uh, they can't just immediately pivot from supplying the West with oil to supplying China or, or other East Asian nations with oil. They don't have the shipping capacity to do that. And if we can impose, even just with uh, Western allied nations, a coordinated oil embargo on Russia, we would severely undermine the source of currency that they're using to fund their invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I'm going to continue to advocate that we do that. Uh, we know that clean energy production here in the United States is critical for the environment and public health. And uh, Brookline, in many facets, has been a leader on this transition to clean energy. Uh, we know that it's good for the economy. The fastest growing job sector in Massachusetts and in the nation widely is clean energy. Uh, we know that it is a source of tremendous innovation, uh, geothermal, fusion, batteries, solar, wind, and so much more. Uh, the United States and Massachusetts are leading the way in new technologies. But now we also see clearly that clean energy independence is also a national security concern uh, we cannot be on the hook to Russia, uh, to Venezuela, to Iran, to Saudi Arabia for uh, the most important commodity in the world. We need to have uh, our own secure supply, and it needs to be sustainable and clean. Congressman, thank you so much for being here and for that update. We do have um, a couple minutes if board members um, would like to ask any brief questions or make any comments. John. Yes, Congressman, thank you again. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could just add a word or two on um, refugees and uh, U.S. policy. And uh, I, th I believe there's been some actual uh, 
developments, maybe even as late as, as, as recently as today on that? Absolutely, I appreciate the question. I'm, I was remiss not to, to raise this. Uh, I was proud of the Commonwealth in its eagerness to accept and welcome Afghan refugees last year uh, as we faced the withdrawal. And we are gonna need to do the same with Ukrainian refugees. President Biden announced recently that he would be accepting 100,000 Ukrainian re refugees under special authorities that were granted to him, that have been granted to all, to all presidents with refugee acceptance. Um, that's a start. We should take many, many more than that, many multiples of that. Uh, it's not just the right thing to do. It uh, will be beneficial to us economically, culturally. Uh, we do better as a commonwealth when we um, welcome people the world over, uh, people with great talent and perseverance and work ethic. And uh, we should be taking many orders of magnitude, many multiples, I should say, more of the 100,000 than the president has announced. And I've been clear about that uh, from day one. Uh, and I, I expect that we will. Thank you. Uh, Bernard. Bernard, I, I can't hear you. I'm techno technologically inept, sorry. Um, I wanna uh, just mention one other aspect of this war, in other words, bringing the war home, as we used to say, um, that, that uh, we in Brookline really should, should be thinking about. Um, the impact on the oil market and, and food market. You know, Ukraine and Russia are huge uh, exporters of wheat and other foodstuffs. And that, that's gonna have an impact on inflation throughout the country. Um, and here in Brookline. And I think that you know, we should just anticipate that uh, depending on how this uh, situation over there you know, uh, unravels or, or, or develops, um, we may have to you know, increase our, our support for um, our residents who uh, are uh, suffering from, um, from food insecurity and, and, and other things right now uh, that uh, may be even more of a problem uh, going forward. So I, I just hope that people here in Brookline realize that this is something that is now and will in the future impact uh, us and, and how we um, deal with uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the needs of our residents. It's an excellent point. Fully agree with you. Uh, the United States uh, has some buffer from the wheat export disruption from Ukraine and Russia because we, we have a number of other sources of importation and, and a fairly significant domestic production capacity. Uh, but you're right, we will absolutely be affected. Uh, I think it's important to be candid about that. Uh, war and pandemic coupled together over the last two years have been inflationary uh, without doubt. Um, and then there are countries, especially on the Mediterranean, uh, Egypt most particular potentially, that are, are facing severe food shortages and potentially even famine because of this. All right, thank you. I, I, I just wanna just say one more thing that, 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 we, that definitely needs to be said is what we're talking about here when we talk about Russia is the Russian government, uh, not the Russian people. When we talk about um, China, we're talking about the Chinese government, not Chinese people. And um, you know we have to be really careful that, um, that the, um, the, the, you know, the things that we're doing politically, um, that we need to do politically, um, do not translate into the kind of, um, let's say, anti-Asian sentiment that we've seen in the past. Um, some anti-Russian sentiment that we've seen that we've seen reasonably uh, recently, and uh, it's not too long ago that uh, that the the leader of our government was someone who many of us were ashamed to have as leader of our government and made some really terrible choices that that I know folks on this board disagreed with. So, um, just um, keeping you know all people. Um, in our hearts and minds and um, as we as we seek an end to this. Uh, Miriam. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Congressman. And I think on that note too, I think it's it's an important time for us to reflect how we approach refugees because I think also we can see when the refugees are white, how the world responds when they are non-white and how the world responds. And I think these are important conversations to have. I think things, these are things we need to recognize in ourselves in our policies and our practices. And this is a perfect example of that. 
So I want to elevate that as part of this too. Thanks, Mayor. Congressman, uh, oh, Bernard first. Hey, I, I appreciate what you said, Ro, because uh, you know, one thing that we can learn you know, from what's happening in Russia is what courage is. Um, you know, people, uh, despite the horrible authoritarian uh, regime that they live under, um, are fighting back, uh, like we fought back during a previous uh, period in our, in our history. Um, and, and, you know, we, we should really use that as, a, um, as, as something to learn from. And not only, you know, are we not seeing the Russian people as our enemies, but rather we're seeing the courage that uh, many of them are expressing uh, and, and use that as sort of a, uh, a, a learning tool for ourselves. So. Well said. Uh, John? Yeah. Okay. Congressman, any final words for us? Uh, Vice Chairman, just that I appreciate the opportunity to address you on this. It, it has, of course, a uh, deep meaning for me as, as a member of Congress, but also personal resonance. Uh, my great-grandparents fled Ukraine before World War I, fleeing uh, anti-Semitic violence there and built a new life in Massachusetts and, and ended up uh, in Brookline. And, and my, uh, my mother grew up there. And so it, it's full circle for me to uh, be speaking on this subject to, to the town of Brookline. And I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you. And um, we, we wish you all the best. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Take care. All right. So um, next up, we have um, announcement at announcements and updates. I'll give two quick announcements and I'll hold another one for just a little bit later. Uh, but the two quick ones, um, first off, um, the town election uh, is next Tuesday, May 3rd. Maybe each one of us will give that update. We'll remind you that there's an election coming up next Tuesday. Um, you know, uh, usually uh, the focus is at the top of the ticket in these elections. Um, in this particular election, the focus is on, I think it's 246 town meeting seats um, which are which are up um, across uh, I think it's uh, almost, almost all of our precincts I think at least at least one uh, and so we encourage you um, to go to um, the Brookline website on elections um, to learn more um, seek out other information that you can find on the election and please 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 show up to vote the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. next Tuesday May 3rd um, please have your voice heard um, the other quick update I want to share is that April is Fair Housing Month. And the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, CHAPA, will be awarding a 2022 Out Open Door Champion Award to the Town of Brookline for our initiative and commitment to lower Brookline's local preference threshold. We lowered the local preference threshold from 75% down to 25%. Um, and Senior Housing Planner Virginia Bullock and Housing Advisory Board Chair Roger Blood uh, will be part of CHAPA's Fair Housing Symposium on Thursday at 1.30. You're invited to join at chapa.org. Hey, my, that's my daughter, Maya, you might hear in the background there. Uh, and, um, and just wanted to say, this is, this is so important. Um, you know, the, the Housing Advisory Board and the town recognizing um, that local preference um, is good in some cases, but not good in all cases. And in this case, um, you know, if we want to make uh, affordable housing in Brookline uh, much more racially diverse than it has been historically, that lowering that preference was key. We got it done and we're being awarded for it. Um, kudos to everybody who worked on that. Um, other announcements and updates from board members. Bernard. Uh, was Marion first? Also, okay. Also yeah. <laughs> well, uh, because we probably will not be meeting next week on May 3rd because it's uh, election day and it's a local election. I hope everyone in, in, uh, in our audience and, and our TV audience um, is, is appreciative of the fact that for residents of Brookline, maybe the local elections are way more important in guards than, than the November election. So, you know, get out there and vote because it's, it's relevant to us, uh, not just, um, you know, relevant to the entire globe as November many times is. But I want to remind people of an important and informative event that will happen on Sunday, May 8th, which yes, is Mother's Day, but we can do two things at one time. It's the Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee uh, event. Uh, and it's one of the many educational events that supplement uh, our main event on Martin Luther King Day in January. The title of this event is A Family Revealed, Two Descendants of a Confederate Enslaver Share Their Story. It will be an afternoon of engaging music and conversation featuring folk singer and social activist Reggie Harris 
and longtime Brookline educator and resident, Wallace Reamer. Admission is free, but uh, reservations are required. And the best way to make your reservations are go to the MLK webpage and do it there. The program will be held live at the Coolidge Corner Theater on May 8 at 2 p.m. And COVID protocols, of course, will be in effect. The program will be aired uh, live on the Brookline Interactive Group's YouTube channel and on Comcast and RCN on channel three. I guess people who use those know how to do that. <laughs> Ms. Reamer grew up in Richmond, Virginia, where there was a statue of her ancestor, Confederate General William uh, Wickham, in the center of town. As she grew older and after meeting Reggie Harris, also a descendant of Wickham, through his ancestor, Bibana Hewlett, one of the 275 people that he enslaved, she began to understand the negativity of that statue and was involved in efforts to bring down the statues in Richmond, including uh, the statue of Wickham, um, one of many such statues that were removed from other places uh, uh, over the past few years. So this is going to be a very, very interesting, informative, educational program, and uh, I urge people to uh, go to our website, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee webpage, and um, sign up for it. Thank you. John. Thank you very much. So a couple of announcements. Um, the first one having to do with the US Open, which I think most people are familiar with, coming to Brookline in June, um, coming to the country club. And what people might not be aware of is that there has been a considerable effort mounted by some folks um, from the community. I'll, I'll confess that I'm one of them uh, to work with members of the country club um, and work with uh, uh, leadership from the uh, uh, USGA, the US Golf Association, uh, to see if the, uh, the US Open could become a uh, banner event for recognition of the importance of uh, addressing climate change. And um, there's a lot of details to report on some recent um, agreements that were reached as to how sustainability and how addressing climate change will be recognized um, in many, many significant ways uh, by the US Open event itself and by the USGA and, and the country club. But for now, I think I will just leave um, the details till later, but I wanna express some thanks to some people who were very instrumental to this. Uh, John DeVillage from the country club, uh, Natalia Linos from our own uh, 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 Public Health Advisory Council, but also very active um, on behalf of uh, the climate change issue. Uh, Wendy Stahl, David Gladstone from the Chamber of Commerce, Lisa Cunningham, Ken Goldstein. Um, they, they worked with some folks from the Country Club, and I'm going to name a couple of them because they, they really deserve some credit for the accomplishment that was, um, that was achieved. Uh, uh, by, uh, Vice Chair of Community Relations, uh, Glenn Johnson was key, um, as was um, uh, Director for Transformational Initiatives, Dave Asnavorian, um, as was our own Tom Barrasso, uh, Director of Sustainability Planning. Uh, and finally, I'm gonna mention uh, the Managing pr Principal for Waste Management for the, for the tournament and a Brookline native, Lee Spivak. So as I say, I won't go into the details of what was um, achieved in terms of uh, various recognitions of climate change, not just symbolic, but also very, very real um, uh, uh, measures that will be taken to recognize the importance of addressing climate change. Thank you to the uh, USGA. Thank you to the Country Club. Um, and sort of um, very appropriately, my second message is all about someone who was way ahead of his time in terms of recognizing the importance of um, preserving nature in, in our urban environments. And he's being celebrated today um, in, in a very um, important ways, not just in Boston, but in New York and across the country. Um, it's the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, our own um, Aaron Gallenstein, <laughs> Aaron Gallantine, excuse me, Aaron, um, uh, put out something today to basically draw attention to this anniversary, draw attention to the fact that um, Olmsted is recognized as the founder of American landscape architecture. Um, he was the nation's foremost park maker. He moved to Brookline um, in 1883, established the world's first full 
Scottsdale Professional Office for the Practice of Landscape Design. And we have Olmsted to thank for Central Park in New York, um, but also for the Emerald Necklace in Boston. Uh, we have Olmsted to thank for the um, Jamaica Pond, for the Fenway, for the Esplanade. Um, cannot um, overstate the importance of him in, in our history. And it's great that he's being recognized locally. He'll be recognized tomorrow night uh, or this anniversary will be recognized tomorrow night at the Boathouse at Jamaica Pond. It's an event that was actually postponed from tonight. Um, and then it, um, this will be part of the Springfest uh, event that is coming to Brookline on May 7th um, in the Olmsted Park at what is known as the Allerton Overlook, if you're familiar with the Allerton Overlook, uh, overlooking Leverett Pond. So thank you, Frederick Law Olmsted, for everything you did for Boston, for New York, and for um, spreading the message of uh, the importance of parks um, all over this country and, and being such an important uh, influence in this country's development. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Miriam. Thank you. So um, I just want to remind everyone to vote on Tuesday. Um, and you can vote early at Town Hall, the absentee ballot voting, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. this week. So um, I actually plan to do that myself. Um, Good idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> and the polls will open Tuesday, 7 a.m. and they'll close at 8 p.m. Um, that's the only like actual town announcement. The, the rest is I'm going to take just three minutes of your time for a little personal soliloquy. Um, <laughs> and yes, I had to practice saying that. Thank you. Um, so for the, those of you that know, and now for those of you that don't know, this is Raul's last select board meeting. Um, I would not absolutely a thousand percent not be sitting in this seat if it were not for you, Raul, both as a mentor, as a friend, as a colleague. Um, so I really need to recognize that. I'm, I'm a little sad and scared that you're going. <laughs> I need to recognize that too. Um, I will be calling you a lot still. So don't take me off the speed dial. Thank you. And thank you to Laura Bradford who helped me pull this off too. So I have just some treats to thank you. And of course we can't have, absolutely cannot have cookies without bourbon. And can we all see the title? The name of this bottle spoke to me. It's called Angel's Envy. That is just for you. I don't drink bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> I promised it would be short and uh, I just really, yeah. So, so well deserved, and I hope you drink that bourbon tonight. <laughs> That's it. A little bit of it. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. <laughs> Depending on how this meeting goes, it might get open tonight. We'll see. <laughs> Things go. Thank you so much, and we should pass this around and share this with everybody um, who's here. Um, thank you for that. I, I wanted to. Um, there's some folks in the audience um, and joining us online who are um, our family and friends. And I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, and there's Christina right there, uh, my partner and our, our daughter, Maya, who's with us. Maya is definitely watching Elmo right now. Um, she's been to a lot of rallies and protests, but I think this is her first select board meeting. Um, maybe, maybe her last, I don't know, she'll come see you. <laughs> um, but um, so I, 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 I wrote down a few words that I just wanted to share with you all. Um, and, uh, you know, in typical fashion, there are some words of thanks and some challenging words and um, that just some things I wanted to say before, um, before I go. Um, and then we'll move on to public comment to the rest of our meeting. The folks that are like, what the heck is up with this meeting today? Yep. <laughs> Bet she will. Um, I might need one more minute. Um, so today is my final select board meeting. Uh, I wanted to offer some some parting thoughts. Uh, as you may have heard, I'm leaving the select board to run for state representative and hopefully build on some of the work that we've done here together. Um, and just I wanted to note that it really has been collective work. Um, that is the way that um, our, our our government is set up is for us to work collectively and collaboratively, sometimes at odds, but deliberatively to try um, to deliver the best possible results. Um, and, you know, a lot of that work is done alongside advocates and community members, uh, and it's also done alongside um, staff like, like Mel and Devin, uh, I see Joe and others who are, are here now, but so many staff that you never get to see 
um, in these meetings and never get to meet who make um, this government work. And of course, um, work done by my colleagues on this select board, on the school committee, the library trustees, and in a seemingly infinite number of boards, committees, and commissions where people volunteer their time um, to try to try to make this government work for the people who live here. Um, so I just wanted to recognize everybody here. Uh, I think we've done a lot of really good work over the last few years since I've been on the board. Um, I will say that I'm especially proud of how we have worked together to navigate um, this terrible pandemic and especially the worst of it. Um, we put in strict public health measures, which at times are controversial, but I know save lives, although not enough. Um, we removed obstacles for small businesses in our community, which I know kept small businesses open in Brookline, but not enough. Um, and we created, um, through Mel's leadership, this community-engaged ARPA allocation process that I know led to meeting, is leading to meaningful transformative investments in underpaid families and kids and immigrants and older adults, the folks in our community who need the most resources and, and policy directed toward them. We did that and we did it well, and I wanna recognize that. Uh, it's been an honor for me to serve the people. <clears throat> I should. <laughs> it's, it's been an honor for me to serve the people of this town, and especially to represent the issues of those whose perspectives have long been underrepresented in our governance. Um, I tell people all the time that the Brookline they remember or think they know is not the one that I see us at least becoming. Um, that allegedly progressive community that talks a good game but doesn't back it up with policy, I think, is increasingly becoming a Brookline of the past, um, although there's some that maybe wish it wasn't. Uh, I am proud to live in a town where many more people care as much about their neighbors as they do about their own personal interests, where, yes, we care about climate and transportation and racial and economic justice and housing affordability. And I know may, may not always seem that way by listening to some voices during public comment or town meeting debates or certain boards or on Facebook, um, but that ain't the true voice of the people here. Um, I still remember my final speech of the 2019 campaign, the weekend before election day, where I said I was placing a bet on Brookline. I'm placing a bet that Brookline is ready to be pushed, I said. I'm placing a bet that we can talk about racial justice and win an election in a predominantly white community. And I was right. And that was before the murder of George Floyd and the righteous uprising that followed and put racial and economic justice front and center in our community and around the country. I won that election convincingly. And by the way, my colleague, Mary Mashkenazi, topped the ticket in her election on a similar platform because that is who Brookline is. But change does not come easy. There are many forces that conspire against change, apathy, Ignorance, respectability politics, delay tactics, convoluted forms of government, lack of access, and the like, which is why it's so remarkable when change, real meaningful change, does come. It is under these conditions that we created one of the few governmental bodies in the country to focus on reimagining public safety, our select board's task force to reimagine policing in Brookline. And under these conditions, despite misinformation and sometimes hateful rhetoric, had meaningful changes to policy and meaningful commitments to invest in social services adopted by the select board. It was under these conditions that we finally reached a just settlement with firefighter Gerald Alston, which was approved by this board and town meeting. That was something I campaigned on publicly and that voters sent me in this office to get done because that's who Brookline is. Brookliners want to upend a system that works for some, but not most, and especially not for those who need it, need it most. Maybe not select all delete, but certainly find and replace. Find a housing system based on scarcity and replace it with one based on abundance, affordability, and dignity. Find an economic system rife with inequities and replace it with a system that provides support and resources for kids, families, and older adults struggling to maintain a, a Brookline as their home. Find an education system that says it values kids of color and its educators and replace it with one that delivers an anti-racist curriculum and exceptional anti-racist, well-compensated educators. <clears throat> Find a climate policy devoid of any urgency and replace it with one that matches the scope and scale of the crisis before us and one that centers environmental justice at its core. That's what Brookliners want. Let me tell you, there are many more of us who wanna move Brookline forward to create a more racially just and equitable Brookline, a Brookline for everyone. And we need more people to run for office who get that and more of us to show up the polls to get them elected. Serving a local government is meaningful and impactful and we need more smart, progressive-minded people to step up and serve. It's one of the best investments I think you can make with your time. 
As I wrap up, listen to me when I say, I believe there is no moral arc to the universe except that which we bend to our collective will. Justice, real, racial, economic, climate, and otherwise, requires vigilance because even the most hard fought gains are soon lost without it. I'm leaving this board, but I'm not leaving Brookline. My wife and our kids have made this our home. Uh, I'll be here ever vigilant as an advocate and activist and hopefully your state representative. Um, but to our amazing staff and my colleagues who remain on the board and to our new member who will join this board after next week's election, please remember to focus your attention on those who need it most. Those struggling to move from surviving to thriving. Because for them, the stakes are high and the hour is late and there's much work to be done. So please act accordingly. I'll be watching. Thank you, everybody. And now to public comment. Oh, great. Um, there's some things I'm supposed to say before public comment that I did not pull up. I'm busy uh, chairing and also um, doing all this tonight. So give me one second to get that together. Here it goes. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for public comment. This is an opportunity for us to hear your perspective on the issues in Brookline that matter to you. We do have a few rules I'd like to share. Each person speaking tonight is limited to three minutes. You don't need to use the entire time, but you may if you like. Please refrain from personal attacks and from addressing personnel issues during your comments. Members of the public sometimes raise questions during public comment. We may be able to provide a quick answer to a question, but are more likely to work with staff to get a more thorough answer and respond over email. We'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is up, please conclude your remarks at that time. If you have more to say, you're welcome to send an email to board members expressing your thoughts in greater detail. So Devin, for my last time, who's first on our list? The first person signed up for public comment is Amy Takanami. You can join us at the presentation station, unmute, and your three minutes will begin. Is this on? Good evening, y'all. Amy Takanami, she, her, hers. I'm a current town meeting member in Precinct 10 and here to just share my gratitude and celebrate Raul's service on the select board over the past three years. Raul, thank you for embodying justice in every single way, shape, and form during your time on the select board and for just holding it down up there and being our movement leader for racial, economic, and social justice. Thank you for your mere presence and visibility on the select board, making other young folk of color holding progressive politics like myself feel seen and represented here in Brookline. Thank you for loudly, proudly, and consistently championing the issues that would uplift our most historically marginalized communities in Brookline, knowing that when we uplift those at the margins, everyone benefits. Thank you for actually practicing one of your favorite phrases, policies, not platitudes, by co-creating the BHA working group, for advocating for and chairing the task force to reimagine policing, for creating the racial equity advancement fund, and so, so, so much more. I wanna share my deep, deep, deep gratitude for the precious time, energy, care, and love you poured into this town and into our community in all of these ways and so much more. And I can say for certain that you're leaving it in a much better place than when you came in. You've set the bar high and truly expanded what is possible here in Brookline in terms of racial, economic, and social justice. And I hope all of us, all of us here in this room are able to step in and step up to continue to keep all of this important work alive. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Bonnie Bastian. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Hey everybody, my name is Bonnie Bastion and this is Simone Leggett. Um, I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 5. Um, thank you for allowing me to make a public comment. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I wanted to speak tonight very briefly because um, it is Dr. Fernandez's last day on the select board. 
Um, and in many ways, Dr. Fernandez, you and your work in Brookline are why I am involved in Brookline politics and organizing. Um, and I'm sure that there are a few others that could say the same. Um, you showed us that real and meaningful change is possible in local politics, and you have modeled making that change with deep, deep integrity. That, along with your clear vision and leadership in the service of racial justice and equity, is what has been so, so important to me. Um, the select board is a very, very difficult and often thankless job. I have learned that very thoroughly over the past couple of, of years, watching all of you up there. Um, your time on the select board hasn't been easy. I know, in fact, I know it has often taken a really big toll, but you need to know that Brookline owes you a debt of gratitude for holding the line in that select board seat, often under duress. We thank you for all that you have done here to move Brookline towards a more just and equitable future. And we will be pulling for you and working hard to move you into your next seat at the State House. So Raul, my friend, thank you. You have made a very large impact in a very short time and we will miss you greatly in this room, but we look forward to all that you do next. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Mike Sandman. Mike, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video and your three minutes will begin. There we go. Um, that was a uh, role that was uh, an, an impressive and inspiring uh, speech. And I hope you will indeed be watching as we carry on. And um, uh, I expect to sit in your seat uh, and uh, it's going to be an interesting seat to fill. I hope you'll uh, remind us when we uh, appear to, to fail to follow your exhortation to look after the people who need it the most. Uh, it was a powerful statement and uh, I think we all uh, will work to, to pay attention to it. Thank you. At this time, I'll see if anyone else in the room would like to make a public comment. Do you know? I have to get to AC, so if they watch me, hi, I'm here, you guys. I'll be logging on soon, but I had to pay my respects. So Ra Raul, I, you know, I, I want to thank you for stepping up and and sitting in that seat, saying what you mean, and actually following through, helping break down barriers that. I've known my whole life. And um, until you sat in that seat, <laughs> it started breaking. Um, we hear you. Uh, we hope you're watching uh, and speaking up when we, when we do start to like fall a little bit, you know what I mean? Um, but I, I just wanna say, I appreciate you. I, I, I you, the Racial Equity Advancement Fund to, to Helping with the language of that. Just, just to everything about you, my brother. Okay, I, I, I want you to, I want you to know that you, you're definitely gonna be missed sitting, sitting there. And, you know, Mike, Uncle Mike, I, I know he's, you know, he'll, he'll hold it down um, while you're gone. And I, I, you know, I just, I just want to say thank you, man. I really, really appreciate you. BIPOC community of Brookline appreciate you. I just want you to know that, all right? So thank you. Thank you all right. I'm Bob Miller. 
uh, town meeting member currently precinct eight, hopefully precinct two. Uh, um, I uh, didn't prepare anything, but I realized that I owe you a thank you. And really that's what I have to say. I wanna thank you for your leadership, for, um, you know, keeping, for taking, you know, keeping us um, honest and for pushing us and for not always, you know, taking the, the, not shying away from tough tasks and tough um, challenges and holding us accountable for the same. And I hope uh, and look forward to you doing that and continuing to do it as we try to become the community that we all envision uh, Brookline being. So thank you. been just a very brief statement. I remember um, when we were trying to pressure you to run for select board, <laughs> you took your time and some of us thought you would take a long time. We worried if that would make it hard to get you elected. And then of course you finished at the top and you're just always at the top and at the top end with your eye on who isn't in the room and whose voice needs to be listened to and making that manifest. Um, thank you for showing up here for three years, night after night, not at all easy. And in the midst of raising a child, starting a marriage, um, doing it with equanimity and dignity and grace. And I, I think any, everyone in this room is deeply sad and deeply proud. And um, thank you for everything. Hi, good evening, Chi Chi Wu, uh, town meeting member for now, Precinct 7. Um, I wanted to get up and thank Raul um, for dragging me into town politics, <laughs> um, for getting me involved. Um, you know, I've been in Brooklyn for 30 years, and it really took someone of Raul's just amazing um, passion for this town and his leadership um, to, to get me involved. Uh, I thank you. I'm not sure my husband thanks you, though. <laughs> and I don't know how many times I've listened to you think and thought, Brooklyn is incredibly lucky to have Raul um, be a leader in its midst. midst. Um, you've been transformational for this town. I am hoping uh, that you will continue to be transformational for this town in a different role. And I am hoping that those of us who keep working on town politics can follow in the very large footsteps that you've left. So thank you. This time there are 19 attendees on Zoom and approximately 12 attendees in person. And no one is using the hand raise or Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a comment. All right, um, let's move on. Thank you all, appreciate you for being here. I should also give a shout out to my folks who have been attending every one of these meetings or at least watching every one of these meetings. So um, thanks to Raul and Yvonne for um, paying attention, learning a lot about Brookline. They almost um, called you all one time, by the way, um, in 2020, they were ready to call Bernard and see what's going on. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I read the statement. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to them. Thanks to you all for being here. You're welcome to stick around. Uh, we're about to go into some mis miscellaneous items and some, some other business. I see Ryan already out of here. Um, but uh, thank you. No, but you can take this with you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Maya, it's bedtime. Good night. And Christina, thanks for being here. I love you all. All right, let's get into it, folks. Um, we got some business. Um, the first uh, thing we have here is a um, question of approving the meeting minutes uh, from April 19th, um, 2022. Uh, any other edits or uh, issues with those meeting minutes? 
Let's get into it. Um, I move approval of those meeting minutes, April 19th, 2022. Uh, Bernard. Aye. John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. It's an aye for me. All right. So now the most fun part of the gig uh, <laughs> uh, is going through the miscellaneous items. Uh, so uh, I'm going to run through these and then we'll move them together. Um, 6B is question of a, accepting a gift from one tree planted to plant 122 new trees in the town of Brookline in the amount of 48,500. Thank you. Um, 6C is question of authorizing the following promotions within the fire department due to a recent retirement. Uh, we have a fire lieutenant and a fire captain. 6D is question of approving the authorization of hire requests for two economic development and long-term planner positions in the Department of Planning and Community Development. 6E, question of approving the following transfer request within the town clerk's office in the amount of $33,000 for election machines. Um, that's moving $33,000 from permanent full-time to office supplies. Uh, 6F, question of approving change order number 22 with Skanska USA in the amount of $98,778 for various additions and deletions to contract work. 6G, question of approving change order number two with Heimlich Landscaping and Construction in the amount of $17,780 related to the Cypress Street Playground Project. 6H, question of approving change order number 13 with CTA Construction in the amount of $14,283.47 related to Tap and Gym, Tap and Gym Renovations Project. 6I, uh, question of approving contract amendment number 27 with William Ron Associates Architects in the amount of $34,649 for services related to 22 Tappan Street. 6J, question of approving change order number seven with MB Kenny in the amount of $72,289 uh, for emergency stops and CO detectors, emergency power to HVAC equipment and to relocate boiler control panels. 6K, question of approving the application for the fleet, uh, sorry, feet of clay pottery studios sidewalk sale event on Station Street, scheduled for April 30th, 2022. Uh, that's this weekend, sounds fun. Uh, 6L, question of approving a temporary alcohol, uh, all alcohol beverages non sales license to the Lars Anderson Auto Museum uh, to be held on May 6, 2022, for a corporate dinner. Uh, 25 people expected to attend. Uh, 6M, question of approving the following temporary wine and malt beverages non-sale license to the Lars Anderson Auto, Auto Museum, uh, May 5th for an exhibit opening cocktail reception, May 7th for a nonprofit reception, May 13th for a nonprofit fundraiser, uh, May 18th for another nonprofit fundraiser. 6N, this is the last one, question of approving the following temporary wine and malt beverages non-sale license to the Lars Anderson Auto Museum again, May 19th for a corporate anniversary party, May 20th for a hospital employee party, May 21st for a wedding, May 28th for a wedding, tis the season, and May 29th for a bar mitzvah. Uh, all those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. It's an aye for me. All right. Next up, we have a change of manager at Barcelona. Who do we have with us today? Okay, Isabel and Elizabeth. Are they in the attendees? Oh, they're here? Okay, great. Um, Isabel or Elizabeth, um, please introduce yourselves. Let us know who you are and um, hopefully we can move forward with this change of manager. Good evening, members of the board, Elizabeth Pisano from Upton, Connell and Devlin on behalf of the applicant Barcelona Brookline LLC. Um, we are here for a change of manager. Um, this is with me tonight is a proposed manager, Isabella Del Rey. She's been the regional manager at um, Barcelona Wine Bar for three and a half years now, and she's going to take on the role as the manager of record. Um, she is U.S. citizen, a Massachusetts resident, and she is familiar with the rules and regulations relating to the sale of alcohol, and she is TIP certified. Um, and if the board has any questions, we're happy to answer. Any question from the board? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead. And, oh, go ahead, please. Isabella is the regional manager. Okay, great. Um, well, Isabella, you've taken the time to be here. Would you like to say hi to us? Hi, how are you? 
Great. Glad to be here. <laughs> Glad you're here. I, th I think probably all of us have been to um, Barcelona at one point or another, exceptionally many times, many times, <laughs> an exceptionally well-run establishment. And, um, you know, um, uh, I, I, we're excited to have you in this role. I hope you are too. Thank you. I'm excited. Good. All right. So let's um, move approval of the application for a change of manager uh, for Adriana Veltri uh, to Isabella Delre. Delray, can you say your last name for me, please? Yeah, you got it right. It's Delray. Delray, perfect. Isabella Delray for Barcelona Brookline LLC, doing business as Barcelona at 1700 Beacon Street. All those in favor? Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. And send it yes for me. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. All right. Next up is a reserve fund transfer. Um, we're joined by Erin Galantine and Melissa Goff for this one. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Commissioner Galatine. Um, so we have this revert reserve fund transfer. Is this another, I was gonna ask Mel quietly, but I'll ask him now, is this another one of the board approving, requesting reserve fund transfer from the advisory committee? That's correct. Okay, that's correct. All right, Erin, um, please tell us about it. Correct. Okay, so there are um, two sort of distinct requests that um, you have before you this evening. The first is, um, a reserve fund transfer in the amount of uh, $39,950. This is for emergency storm response uh, with forestry contractual services. It uh, was specifically additional uh, crews uh, from our contract, uh, from our contractor uh, to support uh, the uh, wind event that we had with the uh, the Elsa uh, storm. We also had tropical storm Henri uh, in August. And then the, sig the significant uh, storm response with the nor'easter in October. Um, so for all of these events, uh, we had additional uh, bucket truck contract crews uh, on um, both on standby and then in response mode, uh, helping us with response through the duration of the storm and then clean up uh, for the nor'easter, we also had a crane uh, analog loader helping us uh, through that event and then uh, with a week's worth of time for cleanup, uh, we had two additional uh, crews and that was the event where we had not only high sustained winds, uh, but uh, torrential rain. Okay, um, questions for the commissioner. Hearing none seems important and, uh, and necessary. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, there's two questions here. The first one is a question of approving the reverse reserve fund transfer requests of $39,950 to forestry landscape services to cover emergency storm response contractual services for a series of major storm events and subsequent townwide cleanup. Let's go ahead and move that for approval. Um, or should we, no, actually we can do these together, it looks like. And the second one is question of approving the reserve fund transfer request of $17,081.81 uh, for emergency contractual services to repair 16 feet of broken sanitary sewer service pipeline, uh, pipe leading from the Baldwin School to the main. Uh, so I move approval of the reserve fund transfer in the total amount of $57,032. All those in favor, Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam. Aye. That's an aye for me. Great. Thank Perfect. you, Thank Commissioner. You. Appreciate you. Uh, next up is a Beacon Street bridal path discussion. Uh, we've got Mel for this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the board. So um, uh, what we're talking about this evening is a proposed federal earmark. And uh, for those of you aware, federal earmarks are a way to um, attach local funding um, requirements or is issues in a federal congressional bill, appropriations bill. And so this is a fairly typical uh, process every year. Um, 
We have been proposing the, uh, the design of the Bridal Path Project for a couple of years now. Uh, whenever we're approached by our Congress uh, folks or even folks at the state level to, uh, to, to supply earmarks, it's a very popular project. Uh, this year, uh, it just came to my attention that there will be a uh, required local match um, uh, for these earmarks. And um, so at this late date, it's very difficult to materialize a million dollars, which is um, half of the uh, $2 million design costs. And so uh, notwithstanding the fact that we did take action on ARPA uh, funding last, last week, I would like to uh, ask the board to conditionally approve a million dollar match from ARPA in the event that the uh, earmark um, goes through and they're not a sure thing by any means, but, um, uh, but we, we should appropriate or make some uh, commitment conditionally uh, or else um, the Congressman would not be able to put this project in the, uh, in the queue. So at this time, I do recommend uh, that the board conditionally authorize a million dollars from the next round of the ARPA funding for this purpose. I would say that um, in the event that the earmark does materialize, um, we may be in a position of saying we'd rather have the money funded in a different way at that time. But at this time, the only available source would be the ARPA funding. And I recommend that we do make that conditional appropriation at this time. Okay. Um, questions and comments from the board? I think John, you had some first? You can go to Miriam. Um, excuse me, I really actually did not have a question, but I just wanted to add, get a clarification, if I may. Um, so are, 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 we, are we sort of forward funding this out of, ne out of the next round of ARPA, if, if need be? Is that if, if, if the earmark came through, um, this board would, have, would be on record of, of basically um, designated that funding from, from ARPA, unless uh, we came up with some alternative mechanism. Right. And um, just in case people are wondering um, who are hearing this discussion, <clears throat> there is precedent for that in the first round, right? That we had at least one, one or another uh, example of something that before the end of the process of the community review and so on, we, we had built in at least one or two items of funding that kind of hinged on ARPA. I'm trying, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not remembering correctly. Sure. But, uh, Miriam, yeah, please. Um, so to, I'm going to address your first question, which I think sure. will answer your second question. But um, so the the we did this board did vote on some ARPA money for public health needs that were was outside the realm of the process of the committee. That being said, Heather and I did talk about this. You know, I, I am committed to a transparent process. So this, I'm ha I'm glad we're doing this in a very transparent way. Um, what will happen, what we've agreed on is there, as we had already decided, there was going to be an interim phase with the co-chairs, Melissa and Tyler, earmarking certain funds that needed to be spent that did not require the committee's input. So we talked about this. If the select board decides to take on premium pay, the decision is going to be made in the interim phase, not involving the committee. Uh, we need to earmark some funds for the salary for the grant manager who manages all of the ARPA money, right? So that just has to happen. And so we are going to earmark the million dollars in this interim phase, conditional on the, that Mel and Melissa do everything they can to find another source for the million dollars if they can. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the, the, we decided the best way forward because we need to be able to guarantee the million dollars and this is money that makes money. This, this I think is really falls into that category. This is money that brings us in exponentially more money. So um, it is, you know, it's not gonna go to the committee. It's something for us to agree on as a select board um, without going through the committee. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. And does anybody else have any, I mean, we could vote it down, it's up to us. But, but I'm comfortable doing it as long as we're transparent about it. And I think this discussion means we're being transparent about it. Bernard? Yeah. Yeah, we, we would never vote this down. This is such an important project for Brookline as well as sort of an example for other communities. So um, I know you didn't suggest that, no, that that's a possibility, but I just want to make the point that you know, we really, really think this is an important project and we appreciate all the state and federal earmarks and other monies that we can uh, gather together uh, to make this a reality. So, uh, go up, please. Yeah, and, and just a quick comment on that. Um, 
uh, agreeing with uh, my colleagues, this is extremely important, the Spiral Path Project. And um, Congressman Aachen Kloss, who was here earlier this evening, uh, is we're counting on him to to pull for it as as much as he can and to uh, uh, deliver the earmark to Brookline. Uh, we wish him well, uh, and uh, he's he's been going to bat for us on this um, up until now. And I know he's going to try um, his absolute best to um, come through with this. So uh, people should watch with interest and um, um, say a little prayer that uh, we get one of those earmarks for this uh, Bridal Path project. Uh, and, and I'll just say, uh, I also support this. I will say that um, that it is um, it, it feels unusual that a match be required for an earmark. That's not um, that's not what I'm used to uh, knowing about earmarks at the federal or even state level. Uh, you know, I, I understand the desire to to have Brookline uh, put skin in the game. Of course, we already have skin in the game, uh, and we'll put some more skin in the game if we want this thing to to see this thing to fruition. Uh, so there's no question about um, our commitment toward toward getting this done. It's a good project, as Bernard said. It's an important project. This is um, good for uh, folks who walk, folks who um, who use bicycles, uh, and also folks who drive, uh, as well as folks who use public transportation. This is a really good project, um, and it's going to transform, um, you know, what Beacon Street looks like. And and really, um, we heard uh, some words from um, John earlier about Olmstead, um, really bring us back to that um, original multimodal um, vision of Beacon Street. So it's a really good project. Um, uh, it 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 feels in some ways unnecessary for us to need to do this, but uh, if we're being told that this gives us the best chance of getting that earmark, then um, then you know it, it is something that we can and, and should do. I think Bernard. Yeah. In the sense of Congress, uh, <laughs> oh. you know, for, for many years, for, for a few years, I won't say about many, uh, earmarks have been there, and it's just and, and back with conditions. I think. Uh, Oh, gone. <laughs> um, as I said, you know, it, for many years, uh, earmarks were banned, and, and this they came back just recently with, with conditions. And I think that's a good thing, um, at least in my opinion, because it forces congressmen like our congressman, Jake Ockenkloss, to sort of make alliances with, I don't know, think of some far right uh, congressmen in, in deep in the deep south or, or far west who also have an earmark and the two of them will work together to get their earmarks uh, uh, funded and you know that's just a small thing and doesn't really make up for the total uh, uh, just uh, you know problems we have in congress but it is a way in which you know we can uh, break through some of the uh, the just uh, toxic uh, um, relationships that that exist in this congress that that really hurt us all. So. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, no, anything else on this? It looks like you've got the support of the board. We'll do a vote, but yeah. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move. Um, this is, uh, uh, see if I have a vote actually in our script here. Um, why don't you go ahead and do that, please? I, I would yep. uh, move that uh, select board um, allocate $1 million I recommend that the select board allocate $1 million from ARP, um, the grant to support the matching grant for the bridal path design conditional upon receiving such your mark. Okay. I'll or, move that. Or, or ARP or alternative funding, I think is what Well, we I think want. in this case, um, you know, that's that's implicit, but, I, mm -hmm. but we need a vote uh, for, um, yeah, if you want to add something to the to the yeah. to the vote, I'm sure we could do that. I, I think uh, Arkansas needs a commitment for the money, and and what what we're I think what the board is saying is that you know it's either this money or some other money that you can find if yes. you can. Yeah, so. well, the, and the ARPA is the one that's available now, yeah. so I think that's what he yeah. wants to hear. But mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It, it's okay if you take further uh, you know language that yeah. would indicate what the board's intent in the future might be. Okay. All right. So moving that language, uh, all those in favor, Bernard? Aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. 
And it's an eye for me as well. Um, having spoken, by the way, with our chair, Heather Hamilton, I know she supports this too. So just make sure folks know that. Uh, okay, uh, look at us, right on time. Um, okay. Um, now, would you do that for us, like a request in the Q&A to restate the sure. Uh, moved that the select board allocate $1 million from the ARP grant uh, for design for a matching uh, funding for the design of the bridal path conditional upon receiving a federal earmark. Okay. Is, is we just, we already voted on that. Does anybody have, yeah, would like to, uh, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Kate's got it. Okay. I just want to make sure if anybody had an issue with the, with the language is just said that we would take it up again, but it looks like everyone's okay with that. All right. So um, next up, we have uh, public hearings uh, for uh, a few Warren articles. Uh, we've got the CDICR uh, complaint article, the uh, PFAS article, uh, and uh, resolution on artificial turf. Um, first up is the CDICR uh, complaint Warren article. Uh, we have Mariah Nabrega, Deborah Brown, and Sandy Batchelor. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, okay. Good to see you, Mariah. Uh, so if you can give us um, a brief rundown of this very complicated uh, Warren article, but um, you know, we've got the language in front of us. Uh, just let us know um, what it is, what it does, and um, you know why you recommend we support it. Is it okay if I pull up slides because it is complicated and we have some slides to sort of walk people through it? Does that work? Yep, looks okay. like Devin set you up to do that. Okay, great. So let me see if I can pull those up. Uh, can you see the slides? We can. Perfect. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so I'll try and fly through these quickly, but just the purpose of revising the discrimination complaint process was to ensure that people who experience discrimination receive appropriate support. That there's a fair and timely process for resolving complaints um, and that they have their, their rights fully met. And then that in parallel, that there's a plan to identify patterns of discrimination and reduce um, the sources of those um, actions. Um, so the protected categories um, that this applies to, you can see written on the left, I'm not going to repeat them, but they're in the warrant article itself. This is just from the warrant article. Um, the difference between this and the previous um, language, um, you can see here, you know, basically it was questions of, was it only applicable to complaints made against the town? Um, so that's now been clarified. The actions were limited um, as to what could be done, um, limited in who could hear uh, the complaints, um, lack of due process. And so the new process really addresses um, and clarifies all of these issues. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing other than to say that this was the, the genesis of this was a warrant article at the fall 2019 town meeting. And there's been significant work since then. The committee um, met over 30 times. Um, it was a subcommittee of the CDICR with additional expertise brought in. Um, and so there's been a lot of work done. And since we've submitted, we've also worked closely um, with town council. We had worked with town council before submission and we've gotten additional input since submission that um, you saw earlier today is feedback. So just to walk really quickly through it, um, there's the article 3.14 is the article about CDICR. Um, and then the subsection three is about powers and duties of the commission. So there's a whole new subsection 3.143B um, which is establishes basically this discrimination complaint process. It establishes a committee. It talks about the complaints. Um, I have screen caps of each of the relevant sections on, on the slides that I'm going to show you. You need to wait a minute. And I just want to, uh, the highlights that you see here are the edits that were put in since the Warren article was submitted. This is um, just cut and paste from the document you got earlier. Um, so just going through it quickly, subsection one is just about accommodations that will be offered in this process. Subsection two is about the membership of the committee. Um, subsection three and six are about um, sort of receiving and directing the complaints, um, how they get received, who can do this, other um, venues in which that they can, um, uh, in which complainants can file, um, thinking about alternative dispute resolution, um, the rights of the respondent to receive the complaint, uh, the process about which um, whether or not a complaint is even considered to be plausible um, and what happens if it's not. Um, the investigation itself is in section seven and um, nine. Um, section eight is about the appeal process. 
Um, section 10 is about what happens if there's been a violation, if there is actually found to be a violation. Um, 11 is about retaliation, strictly being prohibited. And then 12 and 13 are about, as I mentioned earlier, this question of looking at um, patterns um, and reporting to see how to change behavior in the long run. Um, I'm not gonna go through this very much, but just to say that there is a, a diagram that helps you sort of walk through the process and the timeline for this. You know, if there's a complaint, then there's this determination of plausibility. If it's, if it's not um, determined to be plausible, then you can still appeal. If it is, there's the investigation. Again, either, either no matter what the investigation finds, there can still be an appeal. Um, and then ultimately there's relief over at the far end, if in fact um, the investigation uh, finds that there was discrimination and then any appeal is not held up. Um, and that's the end of the slides I've got. I know I flew through that so quickly, but I, I wanna leave plenty of time for your questions and, and anything else. Um, just, a, just a quick um, question to help us get a sense of where you are right now. Um, how have things been going over at the advisory committee? Are they at this point um, recommending any changes? How do you feel about those changes? So we, um, because we are working with town council, we haven't actually um, had the subcommittee, or maybe we, did we have one subcommittee? They haven't voted. All I can say is they haven't voted yet um, because, uh, and neither has CTOS um, because of uh, the ongoing, um, work we were doing with town council. We had one meeting with CTOS so far, um, and then we've been working with town council. CTOS is the uh, Committee on Town Organization and Structure. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, let's hear um, from the board, uh, Miriam. Thank you. So Mariah, I saw in my inbox uh, uh, several email exchanges with some edits that have been made. What you presented us today, do those include those edits? Yes. And can you just give me like the three, like, how do you feel about those edits? Sometimes I know that warrant articles, warrant articles get edited in ways that the authors don't necessarily embrace. Um, and so that's important for me to understand, for us to understand. Well, I'm, I'll, I'll respond, but if Deborah or Sandy have different feelings, then they should speak up. I, I thought that the process with town council was very helpful in, um, identifying a few extra areas where language could be tightened up and additional opportunities um, to clarify or improve the language made and also uh, making sure that we were aligned with specific aspects of um, law relating to this. Um, and so the changes that are made, I feel comfortable with. There were some other suggestions that town council made that we did not ultimately accept, um, but it was with the understanding from with town council that it was a question of style or approach and not necessarily that we were, you know, in direct conflict with other areas of law. So I feel Thank comfortable with the way it is now. Yep. Great. Thank the, you. The big issue uh, that town council raised was uh, whether the, uh, in the penalty section, if we're dealing with uh, uh, parties that are not, uh, don't involve town employees, uh, the two private parties, uh, the landlord, tenant, and so forth. Uh, the three hundred dollar penalty, which we wanted to be able to assert, so that uh, there's some teeth in the procedure, uh, is is now uh, questionable. Uh, other towns have it but they have uh, uh, gone through a process of uh, having uh, the legislature authorize uh, uh, the uh, process uh, uh, by a, what's it called? I've forgotten the name. Um, home rule petition. Um, home rule, yeah. So we may need that in the future, but we, we put in language saying, uh, we'll do this if the law allows it. And we will leave the language in because we want um, people who commit uh, discrimination to realize that there could be penalties and consequences uh, it, uh, uh, that this committee can uh, handle. Of course, we can always send people to MCAD, uh, but they take a long time, but have the ability to uh, exact much greater penalties or broader range of penalties. Okay. Thank you. Um, Miriam, you have a follow-up? Yeah, thank you. Yes, actually, 
Um, and uh, I'm going to give this credit to this question of Mike Salmon, who brought it to my attention. Um, one of the elements in the article originally was written provided subpoena powers. Um, so is that power retained in the current article? And what's town council say on that? Are you asking town council that or are you asking us about what I, I guess I'm is? asking whoever can answer it. <laughs> the answer is that uh, subpoena power is in it is retained and there is a specific case law around subpoena and um, that allows that. However, the, the committee itself doesn't do the subpoena. Town council does the subpoena and essentially, so it's a little bit more convoluted in that town council, um, if, if the complaint committee subpoenas someone and they don't appear, then the town council would need to enforce it by going to court and the select board would need to be the party that actually directs town council to um, pursue that who authorizes, I guess, the um, the town council to actually pursue that subpoena. Great, thank you. That's great news. Very helpful. Great, uh, Bernard. Yeah, that, that was my question also regarding subpoena. So it's it's not the uh, committee that actually can enforce the subpoena. It's it's the court, uh, right. as I understand, right? Okay. Correct. Yep. Um, so the other thing, the other question I have is. Uh, you know, reading through this, there's a lot of talk about discrimination, but I'm not sure I can really identify what is meant by discrimination. Um, and and that, that becomes a, a serious issue in terms of, um, uh, you know, what it is that uh, it can become embroiled in this uh, procedure or process um, uh, related to just the type of uh, interactions that people in, in a community have. I mean, if I give you the stink eye, is that a cause for um, a, uh, a complaint? So my, my question really is, how do you define discrimination um, in, in, in the uh, Warren article as currently written? Maybe that's a question for town council. Is town council present? You, know, you all keep referring to town council and I'm not sure if you're actually- uh, Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. In, live and in person. Okay. Uh, Joe, if you'd like to weigh in, of course, um, we know that, uh, you know, it can be difficult at times for um, town council to give um, us advice on the fly and also publicly. Uh, so um, with, uh, with those caveats, uh, welcome. Um, but I feel comfortable answering this question because Great. I've been talking to uh, the proponents for several weeks and my apologies for diving into this in the last month when they've sure. been working on it for three years, but um, and please uh, reintroduce yourself to us. Oh, yeah. Joe Callanan, town council member. Um, but the issue about what is discrimination, and this is what I've tried to um, convey to the proponents, is Brookline wouldn't be able to make new law on what discrimination is. would be bound by state law. So we wouldn't be able to kind of create new things like Brookline protected classes that are different than state law protected classes because we would be interfering with that private um, relationship. And that's one of the areas that is barred under the Home Rule Amendment. So um, we can create this process locally, we can't create new local law. So what due process the, the, um, the committee would have to follow, that would have to be under state law. What would be the protected classes? Again, under state law. So we couldn't create new Brookline local law as to what is discrimination. Can I have please one other question? Um, it's sort of maybe an abstract question. Uh, would this committee or what uh, ethical rules would this committee be subject to, if any? Uh, state conflict of interest law. Um, they would be acting as a quasi judicial branch or you know of the town. So we could, um, if the committee wanted to, they could create um, you know kind of quasi judicial rules of ethics. Rules of ethics, like, like um, you know, administrative law judges at the state um, have, but the only requirement would be 268A. They would be considered, you know, municipal employees and have to deal with the state conflict of interest law. Is there anything about ethical um, rules uh, in the Warren article? I didn't see anything. I'd defer to the proponents, but I don't think so. But there is a broad uh, authority within the Warren article for the committee and commission to create rules and regulations. And, and I think, uh, Joe, you asked and we agreed to put in a clause that said the uh, members of the uh, complaint committee will be trained by a, uh, a program approved by town council because 
we care that uh, people are sensitive to the, the ramifications of due process and, and uh, everything you have to do when you're uh, conducting a hearing. Because one of the other areas that I was trying to advise the proponents on was what I was concerned about, if this were to pass, what would be the source of litigation? So one of the conversations we had today is about a provision about privacy, which was a you know, concern of mine that someone in the process of witness or respondent could sue us under civil rights law for violations of privacy. So the complaint committee, the investigators, the commission, all would need to be trained on you know, what the right of privacy of each individual party in the procedure would, uh, we would owe them that duty. So regardless of, and this is what I brought up uh, in earlier, um, I believe a CTOS meeting, regardless of what, whether it's in the Warren article, I would, I would affirmatively make sure that everybody involved is properly trained on due process and privacy and confidentiality. And you know those areas that if this Warren article were to pass could result in litigation that I'd worry about in the future. So that wasn't an issue of, you know, this, uh, you know, Warren article is going to be ruled invalid by the AG's office or the, you know, courts. It was just something that I was wanting to make sure the proponents understood if this were to pass, this is what town council was going to do in reaction. Mm -hmm. For example, make sure everyone's trained so we're not going to face a flood of litigation because this Warren article passed. Would that training include open meeting law training and or how would open meeting law function or, or apply to a committee like the complaint committee? So it probably would, but most of it could be done in executive session. So they may have, you know, it may be like one of those committees, like a, a preliminary search committee that still has to comply with it, but most of the work would be done be in executive session. So that could be more training that they would need. Exactly. Okay, um, we'll go to John, a reminder that this is a public hearing. So um, after John's comments, I'd like to open the public hearing and see if there's anyone from the public that wants to weigh in. John. Hey, uh, Joe, actually, actually I had a question for you, if you don't mind. <laughs> Not so fast. Not so fast. Um, this is a question that's brand new to me. I've got a lot of questions about this proposal, but this one's brand new to me. And it's based on something you just said about training, privacy, so that we wouldn't, you know, walk into situations where, you know, we might be at risk of being sued because of a violation of privacy. Could an individual member of the, I don't know what to call it, so I'm going to call it this tribunal that judges disputes between persons in Brookline. Um, could an individual member of the tribunal be sued for uh, you know, a breach of privacy on the uh, of someone who has been brought before the tribunal. So the Warren article refers to that group as the complaint committee, and that's a potential possibility. Ab absolutely, both uh, members of the committee, the commission, the chief diversity officer who is involved in this. Um, you know, each um, town appointed official or uh, employee could be sued for civil rights violations. Um, they could also be sued for negligence. That's very unlikely. There's a cap for that. Um, there's a good you know, defense uh, under 258 for a lot of this. But the, the worry that I have is a civil rights violation. And if, and if that were to arise, it would probably be before the committee, could be before the um, chief diversity officer, could be before um, you know, staff involved in the investigation. Thank you. So <clears throat> that right there, which is new to me, is enough to convince me that we don't want to go there. We don't want this um, particular um, Warren article to pass um, because it's going to create liability where liability does not exist um, in, a, in a body that does not exist under circumstances in which we have no clear picture as to what powers this body actually has, because as, as our town council has just um, informed us, it, it, do, it doesn't have the powers to redefine what discrimination is, again, is and, and what are civil rights that are being adjudicated here. It doesn't have the power to subpoena, although under this warrant article, it appears we want to pretend that it has the powers of subpoena. Um, which will exist insofar as they don't get challenged. Then if they get challenged, 
the town council has to go to a court to, to ask that the subpoena be enforced, but wait a minute, the town council can't do that on his own volition. He then has to go to the select board to ask for permission to go to the court to ask for authorization of a subpoena in a dispute between parties in Brookline, one of whom could decide to sue the complaint commission members for having brought the complaint. So I don't like this picture that I'm seeing here of uh, what we're getting and what and, and what for. It, it, it's for a process that we hope, I think in vain, will actually be more effective than the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination process for adjudicating complaints of discrimination. But unfortunately, it's with a commission that doesn't have the same authorization under law as the MCAD, using powers that don't exist under law that are actually available under law to the MCAD. So it's a very confusing, confusing picture to me, but the one thing I'm not confused about is that it's full of um, potentials for legal liability for individuals in the town, as well as uh, these bodies in the town. So just to sort of underscore one aspect of what I, what I just described, um, this question of where does the subpoena power come from, um, it does come from the select board because there is statute that confers to select boards subpoena power. And maybe I sound like I'm just bitter about this, and maybe I am, but I have tried for two years to get the committee that is drafting this bylaw to do what other communities do, which is to simply acknowledge the statute that confers co subpoena power on select boards and to make that the basis of the subpoena power under this complaint commission. And um, for whatever reason, the drafters won't do it. But end of the day, they still have to come to the select board, but for some reason, they won't put into the uh, draft of the bylaw the recognition that only the select board has the power to subpoena. And I think that is exactly where it should be. The select board is elected. We're responsible to the people who elect us. And the alternative is that we're at least pretending um, that a self-appointed committee of volunteers, sort of a committee from within a committee, can confer upon itself subpoena powers. And I don't find that to be plausible, and I find it to be dangerous. So I, that's that's why I, I unfortunately still oppose the current draft of this uh, this proposal. Could I respond to John briefly? Okay. Yeah, I was actually about to say. I know I know Mary has more she wants to say, but um, Deborah Brown is a co-petitioner has had her hand up for a bit. So let's hear from Deborah. And I do want to bring in the public, and then we'll have um, more words from select board members. Go ahead, Deborah. First. I don't think you should see this as the boogeyman. It, honestly, Brookline is behind the times in actually setting up this kind of a structure. So if anything, we are becoming more of the mainstream. And John, I have to respectfully disagree with you. Most organizations have the good judgment to keep politics away from any kind of administrative process because you don't want the appearance of bias. You know, there's a, there's a lot of conversation that, that has taken place oh, about the issue of training people. What kind of people, you know, would best serve in this capacity? And so nobody envisions this being, you know, people with personal agendas or fly-by nights. You know, this will be a serious group of people making serious recommendations, making serious recommendations. And the idea that people will be sued left and, and right, it's, it's specious. I mean, honestly, I, I, practiced I practiced environmental law administratively. I practiced civil rights law administratively. And guess what? I had a guy come after me with a gun once, but that's a different story. I was never sued. And there were times when some of the cases were complicated, but you know what? That's just not the way these things roll. And so I know that you have a bias against this ordinance, 
but I wish that you would not base it on something that's not from fact. It's not a bias, I beg to differ. It's analysis. So, you know, give me that much respect. I, I can't give you any respect over your analysis. I'm sorry, John. I just, I respectfully disagree with you. Your analysis is deeply, deeply flawed. Okay, um, uh, we're going to move to. Um, sure, Bernard. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess related to what John uh, says, a question maybe to town council again. Sorry. Um, would would this committee be subject to um, indemnification uh, as select board and other town officials are? And I think that the assertion that it will be comprised of serious, uh, well-educated, uh, great people is really not enough. Um, you know, in, in this town, I can see a lot of um, potential uh, litigation arising out of a, of, of a uh, process uh, like this. But the indemnification question is the question I have. And secondly, if I may, um, could you just, assert, just tell the audience that uh, the open meeting law exceptions are very, very limited and probably would not apply to the type of, of um, sort of sensitive uh, discussions that uh, would come up under this committee. I mean, if that is the case. <laughs> okay, um, so a couple of things. So let me see if I got them all. Um, so um, the individuals involved in both the investigation and the complaint committee would be either town employees or appointed officials. So they would fall under the indemnification if they're acting within the scope of their duties. If they did something crazy and assaulted, you know, a, a party at the hearing, okay, well, we wouldn't indemnify that tort of, you know, the assault and battery. But if they're acting within the scope of their employment or their appointment, then they would be entitled to indemnification. Um, the question about the open meeting law, um, one, there are only 10 um, ex uh, purposes that you're allowed to go into executive session dealing with the reputation and you know, um, accusations of you know, against someone, that's the one that I would think most apply. Um, I can look at the other 10 and give you, you know, um, an opinion as to whether any others apply. And was there a third thing? Oh, I did want to no, uh, address the subpoena issue. The, the uh, confusion I think people are having is the difference between issuing a subpoena and enforcing a subpoena. If this Warren article were to pass, the committee would have the authority to issue a subpoena. But as we saw recently with Congress and their subpoena power, subpoenas can be ignored. So if the subpoena issued by the committee is ignored, you'd have to go to court to enforce it. So the committee would come to the town council's office to say, we have an, a subpoena that was issued by us that's now being ignored, can you enforce it? I wouldn't be able to do that until I went before the board, because the board is the only authority that can issue, um, sorry, authorize initiation of civil actions. So I think that's where the confusion is about mm -hmm. only the select board um, can issue subpoenas. The select board is really the only body that can enforce subpoenas. Mm -hmm. So you could have other local bodies issuing them, but if they're ignored, only you guys get to say, I can go to court to enforce it. Um, did I answer all your questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the, the, uh, the open meeting thing, maybe we need to just discuss yeah, offline. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I also just, before we go to public comment, um, want to remind members of the board and the public that it was town meeting that set the CDICR on this path to come up with a, um, uh, a bylaw, uh, that would would satisfy um, a resolution that came before town meeting. It was approved at town meeting, and to bring this back to town meeting, and and they and their wisdom um, can decide whether or not um, this is um, this meets what they expected uh, it would, and whether or not the the issues that John and, or others have raised are 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 real issues that we should be concerned about or not. Uh, and so I just want to um, just make sure that we uh, we understand that the petitioners that are here today 
are here because they've done the best possible work that they can on this, that they've they put a lot of thought into this, probably more than uh, members of this board uh, have, frankly, and uh, and also that they've been asked to do this work. Um, so thank you for taking the time um, to do that work. Now let's go ahead and go to, um, to public comment. Uh, the, we are opening the public hearing right now. Uh, are there members, Devin, of the public who wish to comment on this? The first person signed up for comment is Mary Sabolsi. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Um, well, first, I would like to thank everyone on this committee because I'm sure this um, actually from the wonderful slides that Mariah showed us was not a simple undertaking. Um, I guess as a somewhat naive member of the public, my assumption is that part of the reason this committee or the that this undertake this committee was sort of formed and this action was sort of outlined has something to do with the Gerald Alston case and I would like to one of the one of the um, one of the uh, petitioners to answer that question or would this be the kind of thing that would be able to handle that type of a case were it in place were it to pass Perhaps Deborah Brown could answer that for me. Okay. Um, and since uh, I, I hold, hold uh, Sandy, if you can hold tight, hold on. Um, we will. Um, let me. Let me. Um, let's hold that question. Think about the answer, and let's hear from other members of the public. I, sure I have a that. little bit more that I'd like to say, though. Do that um, first, please. Yep. Is that okay? Yes, please do. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, you know, my observation uh, as a medical professional um, who had to have a tremendous amount of training regarding discrimination issues and privacy issues is that um, this type of committee might actually be incredibly useful, um, provided that the individuals who serve on it uh, receive the appropriate training. Um, these issues are complicated and really handling them in a, in a really um, fair and um, impartial way does require training. There really isn't a way to, it's not just a common sense sort of a thing. So I actually do not have, I, I feel that this type of a committee um, with all due respect to the select board might be an improvement uh, to the way these complaints have been handled in the past. Um, but I may not understand what all the complaints are. I just know that in my profession, I had to go through a tremendous amount of training to be able to interact with a large variety of members of the public in an appropriate manner. And I, my suspicion is that that is what the goal of this sort of committee would be is to get a group of individuals who had that sort of background and i'd love to hear more thank you thank you so much the next person signed up for public comment is mike sandman your three minutes will begin when you're ready hi uh mike sandman town meeting member precinct three at the moment um and soon i would hope uh, to join the select board um this uh, whole discussion goes back to the original um, creation of the uh, of the commission uh, goes back at least what, what is that eight or nine years ago, uh, and um, uh, it um, that led that at that time there was a discussion about including uh, some sort of subpoena power. The 2019 proposal included subpoena power for the committee, uh, but did not uh, explain the process. Didn't acknowledge the select board's uh, authority. Uh, and at the time, I didn't support it. Uh, the proposal now, uh, the, the, the Warren article now is written, does include that process. It makes it uh, quite explicit that authority ultimately rep uh, rests with the, uh, the select board, which is where state law puts it. Um, I would uh, certainly support this as a, uh, as a town meeting member uh, and, uh, and would support it uh, if I uh, do join the select board for whatever that's worth. Thank you very much. At this time, there are 14 attendees and no one is using the hand raiser Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a comment.
discussion. Raul, can you turn on your microphone? It's Sorry. off. Thank you so much. I want to now close the public hearing. I do want to continue this discussion, but also a reminder, um, as is our, um, our our usual practice, we're not going to be voting on this tonight. And, and by the way, we still, I think, would benefit from hearing um, from discussion at the advisory committee and elsewhere before we take this up anyway. Um, I'd like to see, um, I know, Sandy, you've had your hand up. Up. Um, you may have uh, more to say. If um, I, I take from Mary's question um, re related to the Alsta matter, uh, let's answer it in this way: um, Is is this uh, is this avenue for logic a complaint open to employees of the town? How about we can get a yes or no answer on that? Yes. The answer is yes. Okay, great. Um, Sandy, what else do you have to say? Uh, I wanted to elaborate on something uh, that. Deborah said, uh, we didn't invent this uh, out of thin air. Uh, during the year that we discussed what we wanted to do and then uh, worked on drafts, we uh, surveyed our neighboring cities and towns, all of which have uh, provisions similar to uh, the one before you. Uh, and uh, we chose what seemed uh, to us to be the best uh, of it and, uh, and, and didn't try and do everything. Cambridge has a, a much more elaborate uh, set of uh, uh, provisions than, than we do. But uh, we uh, are trying to keep up. Um, when the, the commission was formed, it, uh, there was a complaint committee uh, it was never used. No one ever filed a complaint with the original complaint committee. Instead, um, uh, uh, Lloyd uh, Chelano, the chief diversity officer, handled four or five um, uh, discrimination complaints uh, uh, maybe a month uh, and uh, acted as an ombudsman to try and settle them or sent them off to uh, MCAD. So we're filling a gap uh, that exists in relationships to the other towns. And uh, we've had some very good advice uh, along the way. And we think the product before you uh, uh, is something that uh, should work. Um, th there are the caveats that town council uh, has, has raised. Uh, we have to be careful how we do this because uh, personal rights and civil liberties are involved, but uh, we plan to um, be careful. And it will probably take, uh, I would guess, uh, you know, no one has prepared a budget for this yet because it, it probably takes six months, uh, perhaps longer uh, to set the committee up and train it uh, and have it uh, um, ready to publicize its existence we think that uh, there is uh, discrimination in Brookline and that people will come, but we may have to um, uh, do some publicity in order to uh, uh, make sure they know what, that we're here and that we have a, a, a new process uh, that is designed to be fair and solve problems of, of discrimination. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, Miriam, do you, do you have more to say? Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so I'm going to call your argument out, John, specifically, because I think it's a straw man argument. This idea that we are setting ourselves up for liability if we create this committee is a straw man argument because it assumes that we are not liable if we don't create the committee, which I just think is wrong. We are, in fact, still liable. We are still responsible. We are still required to stand up and create a system by which those people who are discriminated against or feel they are discriminated against have some power to voice their concern. And we are the, we are the people who are tasked with protecting them. And so whether we have a committee or not, that task remains at our feet. So I don't think we're protected from liability by not having this committee. I think we are just as vulnerable. So I would rather make sure that we have a path by which to support people, a path by which to investigate, 
to analyze, because we all love data. I'm a data hound, just like you are. But to really get an idea of what's happening in our town and create systems and structures to prevent further injury than to put my head in the sand and say, I don't want to know because you might sue me. So I, I very strongly support this, uh, not to mention that we've asked them to create this, that in fact, neighboring communities have this, but I think we have a moral and ethical obligation to have something like this. And yeah, we all might get sued. Yep, tomorrow by anybody, that's America. I, if, if we made our decisions based on that, we wouldn't leave our house. And I think we are held to a much higher standard than that. So I'm willing to take that risk because first of all, I don't think, I don't think it saves me from not being sued by not having the committee. And I think it's more important that we provide power to the voiceless, mm -hmm. the powerless, and those who are being discriminated against, I'm willing to take that risk. Bernard. Yeah. <clears throat> It, it was stated uh, a few minutes ago that uh, Lloyd received only a few complaints a month and he handled them internally or sent them to MCAD. I guess that raises a question. What is it that we're trying to fix with this committee? Um, sure, you know, the select board is responsible for doing things that uh, avoid discrimination, avoid liability. Um, and, you know, so the question is, what is you know, this committee doing that we can't do already that is better handled in the way it's always been handled by Lloyd? You know, I guess he you know, does mediation, arbitration, or whatever. Uh, and if it really rises to the level of discrimination as defined by state law, there's the MCAD, which is much more capable and, and appropriate uh, to handle uh, such cases than a local um, a commission that, at least in this case, is not very well defined and, and, and is not organized very um, impressively to me, at any rate. So. Um, Mariah, can you respond to that question uh, from Bernard? Um, I was going to, and then my my mind actually slipped what reminded me what the question was so I could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> what what problem are, are we trying to solve? Is that is that essentially a question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. So, uh, they, given that there there are only a few uh, complaints and they're they're handled by Lloyd uh, either directly or through uh, uh, um, referring I, to the MCAD. Right. So so I want to answer that and then I just want to make two other quick comments. So one um, one is that your I think your assumption there, Bernard, is that what is coming to Lloyd encompasses the full universe of discrimination, and we know that that's not right. We know that that's, that subset is not complete. And so um, the, the point of this process, and as Sandy just mentioned, you know, is to do a, have a, a better, more welcoming, inclusive process that's then promoted to the community to be a venue for, for more appropriate, fair resolution of problems. Um, and Lloyd, the, the process and the ability that Lloyd currently has as is articulated in the current bylaw um, is, is limited. And so, you know, to whatever extent people don't uh, pursue it because it doesn't allow them options that they find appealing um, is possibly a reason why, um, why there may be limited. Although frankly, I don't think four or five complaints a month is low. That, that's, you know, one, I hear that and I think that that's actually a lot of complaints, but, but no matter what it is, assuming what that number is now represents the full scope, I think is a little bit of a, a logical um, jump. Uh, I just want to make um, one other point that I can remember. I forgot my second point. It's been a long day. Um, but the one, oh, I remember this, two points. One is that for those of you who don't remember, town meeting actually voted um, already. There's a, there's a revision of this language. Arthur Conquest, um, his original warrant article is set to take effect on July 1st, 2022, if you don't vote this. So the original warrant article that... Um, town meeting voted favorable action on it with a, uh, a, a, a extended time provision, which if you recall last year at town meeting, um, town meeting voted to extend that. So your choice is not status quo or what we've developed. Your choice is the um, unedited warrant article from fall 2019, which will come into effect on July 1st, 2022, or the carefully crafted committee processed town council reviewed 
language that you see in front of you. So I just want to make sure people understand that, that those are your choices. There is nothing else in front of you for the July 1st, 2022 deadline for that other um, language. And then the last thing was just something I should have mentioned earlier, because th this, this talked about Warren Article 12, I believe, on the agenda, but there is an accompanying Warren Article 13, which is more or less just housekeeping. And I just want to note that just so that people understand that there is an accompanying warrant article and just say it's essentially housekeeping, but I want to, I want to just throw that out there so, so people realize it's, it's a pair. Um, thanks, Mariah. I, you know, I, I think that's an important clarification that you make about what happens if this doesn't get voted at town meeting um, this May. Um, the other thing I think I, I would say um, Bernard, in response to your question is, um, similarly, the PCAC, what it does is um, the Police Commission's Advisory uh, Committee that we created um, puts more time on task on an issue that matters to the board, um, but for which we do not have enough time to really focus on um, and give it its due attention. This creates another bot and process by which if, if you look at the end where that box that says relief, um, there is, there's one circumstance in that um, it comes to us, but it comes to us after having been reviewed um, by this, um, this, this selected, um, uh, you know, uh, highly competent uh, group of, of members of the public that, uh, that, have, that have done this work and then comes to the board for whatever relief ends up looking like that this board decides. Um, and in the other case, the civil fine. But I, I just say, I, just say, I mean, there's, um, there, there is, I think, value to doing this and, and we can, we can, um, uh, we can have difference of opinion about the details and whether or not, you know, this is, this is the best possible version of it. Here's where I think we are right now. Um, I, because I would support this moving forward. Um, I hear Miriam saying she would, I hear John saying he wouldn't and Bernard saying he wouldn't right now. So um, I think, I think it makes, um, we can, I will say this and, and Devin reminded me of this. Um, tonight is the last night that the select board um, can have it say in the combined reports so, although of course we always have the supplemental um, reports available to us as well. Um, if if um, if board members would like to 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 have our say in the combined reports, I guess we could. But again, we're dealing we're in a position right now where um, there may be revisions, including substantial revisions here. Um, you know, we're this is this is not a do you yes or no agree with I don't know. Um, I'm not going to bring up another issue. Well, we'll talk about turf in a second, right? <laughs> you know that kind of thing, right? This is a, this is a very complicated process, and as Mariah pointed us out, uh, pointed out to us, something's going to happen here. It's either going to be the thing that I don't much remember the details of from a few years ago, or it's going to be this. Uh, so, um, what do you all think? I mean, would you like to vote it tonight, or is this something yeah, that I don't think we're ready. okay? Yeah, All right, John, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to my uh, fellow select board members. Um, and I do want to say I, I left out the most important part, which is thank you to the committee that has worked so hard on this. I often fail to do that, and I always regret it later. Um, and, and I also want to say to Deborah, you know, forgive me for taking so personally what you said. I, I just, I don't have a good response being told after I've made what I think is a pretty, you know, fact-based um, argument um, that my argument is just bias. Um, I, I don't use that um, response to others I disagree with, and I just hope others wouldn't use it with me. Um, so getting back to some of the facts and why I, I just feel it would be a mistake to for town meeting to uh, adopt this. Um, unfortunately, I don't think most people really understand the history of this, and I don't think they, they fully understand the, uh, uh, the context, uh, which has been cited here. You know, people have said, oh, other communities have this. I urge everyone listening to this discussion tonight to do their own Google searching and see if they can find examples of communities where a board such as this has settled, settled, a discrimination complaint. Even in a community such as Cambridge, which has a very strong uh, law, a law and very clear law and goes into much greater detail than this and says what is an act of discrimination under against this law and says what isn't an act of discrimination under this law. Even in Cambridge, <clears throat> excuse me, you will find almost no cases of neighbor versus neighbor dispute of somebody discriminated against me being settled by their local commission. The, commi the, the Human Rights Commission, which is what it's called in Cambridge, 
um, settles mostly disputes involving housing. The um, Commission against um, uh, Commission on Diversity, uh, Inclusion, and Community Relations in Brookline gets complaints mostly on housing discrimination. And often those complaints are <clears throat> the notice that should have been posted that notifies all tenants of their rights wasn't posted or something such as that. Um, and then there are some very, you know, there can be the occasional very serious um, complaint involving someone feeling they were discriminated against in their attempt to get to, to secure housing, okay? But they don't involve neighbor versus neighbor, employee versus employer, person to person disputes of I felt discriminated against by so-and-so. Um, and this commission uh, proposes to create that process for Brookline in a very, very um, sort of dangerous field uh, of um, sort of authorities that maybe exist but maybe don't exist um, and potential for liability that seemingly does exist. And we've, we've heard that defined very clearly. And <clears throat> I will just conclude by saying that when, when this first came to town meeting two years ago, which prompted this redrafting, <clears throat> excuse me again, um, what you heard said at town meeting, which convinced people that we needed to do something to add teeth, add teeth to our local um, Commission on Diversity, Inclusion and uh, Community Relations and their complaint processes, um, was that we needed to be able to impose fines. Well, I think you heard it said tonight, we're not gonna be able to do that, okay? We can't adopt that. We didn't say that. Ourselves. We didn't say that, John. I thought I heard town council say that. Maybe I didn't. He can correct the... me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, if he, he can correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sorry if I misheard him. Um, but um, do people want that? I mean, I, I'm not even sure we can do it, but if we could do it, is that what they want? They want citizen volunteers who undergo a rigorous training to then be imposing fines on their, basically on their neighbors because um, they have entered into a dispute between neighbors and decided one is right and the other is wrong and we're gonna financially punish uh, the, the side that we think is wrong. Um, you know, this gets us into all kinds of areas that we are not necessarily going to welcome, but most of all, it gets us into a lot of time, trouble and experience that won't be utilized very much. I guarantee you that. The existing process isn't used very much and processes in other communities that we're being told are examples of what we should have aren't used very much because thank goodness, most neighbors don't wanna get into a legalistic, you know, hearing before a commission involving subpoenas and fines just because they've got a, dis a dispute which one person says is based in discrimination and another person says isn't. So, you know, uh, I, I, I've, I've said my piece. I hope I haven't overstated my piece, but I, I do hope people do their own research and uh, come to their own conclusions about whether this is a good thing for Brookline to be uh, adopting. Okay. So I've got John down as a maybe on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, the... Uh, the, here's, here's where we are right now. And I know Bernard's got a hand up. I see Deborah's got a hand up. Um, we've been at this for about an hour. We started this um, during a simpler time when I imagined I might be, you know, able to go grab a drink after the meeting <laughs> relatively soon. So oh, we've only got two items left, a couple Warren articles, a drink no big deal, right? Uh, but here we are. So um, let's hear from Bernard, who's got his hand up. Let's yeah. um, hear from, from Deborah, and then again, we're not going to vote on this tonight, so yeah. I, want, I do want to move us on. Okay, uh, I'll try to be quick. Can so, I, uh, I just say, I've got to step away. I'm supposed to be at advisory committee, so I'm gonna take, take my leave and apologize for missing the last couple of remarks. Cause sorry, thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Over the years I've been on the select board, and even before, I've uh, sort of noticed or heard of a lot of disputes in town not racially or discriminatory types disputes, but the type of disputes that could be sort of presented as discrimination, you know, uh, boundary lines between neighbors. Um, let's see what, what some other things, but things like that, um, where the skills of a, you know, good community relations, uh, community relations type organization would be very, very helpful in terms of addressing 
you know, the underlying problems that people have living together. And I notice in the um, in the revised uh, bylaw, uh, the skill, the field or, or the uh, skill set of human relations, um, you know, expert or professional is deleted and replaced with civil rights uh, professional. And I think that's a subtle change that has uh, potentially significant, uh, uh, you know, uh, creates significant problems in that, you know, we're really downgrading the skills as a human relations professional in the uh, chief diversity officer um, at a time when maybe that is really what we need. May need, you know, uh, a complaint process of some sort but you know what what is required and what we thought we were doing in setting up this uh, the uh, commission originally was to provide among other things an opportunity or or means whereby which we could smooth over some of the conflicts and 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 um, and rough edges of just regular human relations between people uh, and it looks like it looks to me like that is being downgraded uh, and this is becoming as a commission, a more adversarial type of body, which I don't think is, is a good uh, good approach or a good way to go. So, my comment. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Deborah, I promise you time. If there's anything you'd like to say before we move on. Uh, yeah, and I'll be very quick. You know, um, Bernard is correct. If, if, if we do this right, it should not be an adversarial, it should not be an adversarial situation. Uh, a good civil rights person will know how to get people to sit down and have a conversation. You know, that's the whole thing of, of, around alternative dispute resolution, which is actually mentioned in the document. Uh, I, I did want to say that I suspect that, that, that we have a real undercount in terms of the number of complaints that have been received. I mean, I personally have submitted three and I have never heard back. Well, that's not true. I heard back from the office, but it wasn't from the person that I called initially. I had to call back and speak to somebody else. So all I'm saying is that we may have a serious undercount and by creating a more formal structure, we, we may have a more realistic uh, assessment of cases and, you know, Honestly, I think at the end of the first year, we, sh we should sit down and take stock and figure out what works, what didn't work, what makes more sense, what doesn't. And, you know, we, we may well have to tweak some things, but, you know, this is not, you know, some fantastical, you know, scheme that people cooked up. Uh, you know, I, I think we leave our, I think we leave ourselves uh, vulnerable to what could be lurking around the corner. And if, if, if we couple that with, as Bernard said, you know, just being able to smooth over issues, I think we're, I think we're a better town. I really do. So those, those were my comments. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you, Deborah. All right, so we're going to move on. If I hadn't already, I'm officially closing the public hearing on this one. Uh, and um, thank you for your time, Sandy. Thanks for your time as well for being here. And um, I'm sure the board will see you again. Uh, we are now going to move on to Warren Article 22 on PFAS. And I see um, we have um, Clint Richmond uh, joining us. Uh, so um, hello, Clint. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so you have um, as much time as Devin has provided to you to um, uh, to present uh, to the board, and then uh, we'll see what questions uh, board members have or comments. And um, we can possibly take a vote on this tonight if we want to meet the combined reports deadline. So let's see what what happens. Okay. Um, here. How do I do that? Like if you were on your own. Oh, here we go. Share screen. And then just choose the slide that should be pulled up already. Hi, good evening. This is Clint Richmond, town meeting. Yes. Good evening. Uh, this is Clint Richmond. Uh, town meeting member, Precinct 6. 
uh, it's great to be speaking to you all in person. Uh, and um, I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> uh, great to be off Zoom, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, so uh, this is Warren Article 22. It's similar in concept to Warren Article 25, which you already had a hearing on and are gonna be discussing or voting on perhaps later this evening. I'll still be here then. Um, and so I just wanna mention that the co-petitioners are uh, Claire Stamfer, a former um, advisory council, uh, advisory committee member and um, TMM, and Dean Cody, uh, who is my colleague on the Solid Waste Advisory uh, Committee. I don't see page down on here. Let's see. There we go. Um, so this warrant article uh, wants to regulate uh, fluorinated chemicals in uh, common consumer products that have, uh, as we'll see, uh, ready substitutes. But uh, first, I want to give you a little background on fluorinated chemicals, and it's also related to warrant article 24, which is related to some topics also tonight. Uh, first, they ultimately never break down. That's why they're called the forever chemicals, these um, carbon fluorine bonds. Um, they're virtually impossible to destroy. Uh, they can break into smaller compounds, but the, the, the chlorine fluorine, I mean, the carbon fluorine will, will not break in general. Um, it's highly mobile in the environment. There are over 12,000 types, some solids, liquids, gases. Many have serious health effects, but most are unstudied. And um, really, even just the first three bullets are enough to, uh, to warrant regulation of these chemicals. Um, they're produced in high quantities in many applications. They've contaminated uh, the environment and drinking water, uh, contaminating solid waste, including curbside recycling and trash, and are largely unregulated, including disposal. Uh, um, priority is uh, replacing products that contain PFAS that are not currently substitutable or essential to society, such as medical applications. Experts and many regulatory agencies call for them to be regulated as a class, and that's what this um, Warner article does. To show the extent, uh, even this is a limited uh, picture of the extent of PFAS contamination in the Commonwealth, I want to share this map, uh, which shows uh, PFAS contaminated drinking water as declared by the Massachusetts Department of Environment. So red are the communities where uh, uh, interventions are necessary to, to deliver clean water. So some of these communities are drinking bottled water on occasion, um, you know, depending on the situation in the neighborhood. And the yellow ones have uh, the regulated PFAS, which there are only six in Massachusetts. This is just the Massachusetts specific regulation. And then green is where it has not been detected. And you can see those are a lot of those are rural areas. So the goals of this Warren article are to address products that contain fluorinated chemicals. I uh, selected a list um, of newer and more specialized products. None of them are recyclable. Uh, they're available in retail stores, not food establishments. So it's a very limited number of stores. They're products that have ready substitutes and products that have been regulated in other jurisdictions. Uh, this is to support a proposed state, uh, uh, a couple of uh, proposed state PFAS bills that have been endorsed uh, uh, by Reps Vitolo, Educardo, and our future Rep uh, Balzer. Uh, the proposed product bans are cosmetics and personal care products, uh, including spray propellants that contain um, uh, 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 carbon fluorine um, gases, Teflon, which includes glide floss, and are an additive such as, um, as you'll see later, uh, perfluorodecalin and shaving cream. Something you probably didn't even know was available in shaving cream. Uh, compostable foodware products sold in bulk, Teflon cookware, and I forgot to bring my prop because I'm out of practice from being here in person, but I have a cookware that I, that I hope to dispose of someday once they know how to do it, but I'm not throwing it in the trash in the meantime, and uh, fabric treatments. So here's what some of these chemicals look like. They're a bit, um, you know, mind splitting, but um, there's the propellant, there's the perfluorodecalin, and there's Teflon. Uh, here are the products that those, uh, that some of those chemicals occur in. So there's the Glide Floss, there's the Cremo original formula shave cream, and then some cookware. Uh, these all have alternatives, um, uh, readily available, um, uh, non-fluorinated products. Um, you can buy shaving cream without perfluorodecalin. Uh, and of course, the traditional recipe wouldn't have had it. Uh, compostable foodware. Uh, there are certified BPI compostable products. So that would really all that we require is certification. 
Teflon cookware, again, there's cast iron, there's non-Teflon non-stick plant, plans and non-PFAS products for fabric treatments, silicone based and such. Uh, here are the existing laws that it's based on, uh, the proposed law uh, in, this, in the state of Massachusetts, the California law that's already been passed, uh, some proposed laws in um, Massachusetts. Uh, oh, I haven't updated this for Maryland, but anyway, New York has a food packaging law, very sweeping Massachusetts proposed law and a main law. So again, we're not doing anything that hasn't been done before. And that's my last slide. I'll just close by saying that uh, this one article has so far been endorsed by uh, the Solid Waste Advisory Committee, uh, which is advising you and has uh, submitted uh, letters to that effect. Uh, the uh, Climate Justice Committee at First Parish Brookline. And um, I think it was the last, oh, the Massachusetts Air Club. Uh, one issue that is, has come up is enforcement. Uh, we were expecting to utilize the halftime position that's in DPH to uh, enforce our plastic bans, but um, uh, apparently that is a difficult job enough uh, by itself so that um, DPH has uh, requested um, that we you know, trim this in some way. We're still negotiating with them and are certainly receptive to their, their needs. I guess I would put in a plug if it's not too late to upgrade the halftime staff, which is, um, well, it's only 19 hours. So it's an unbenefited position, which is an equity issue to a full-time position. Uh, I, uh, I understand it's being done for uh, leaf blower enforcement. So I hope that could be considered uh, uh, for the public of, uh, Department of Public Health. So one, uh, one possibility that we've discussed with uh, uh, DPH is passing this without any required product and let DPH come up with the list because this one article is not just a list of things that are banned and then story over. There's a, a, a B section in there that says that the list can be added to. And the, um, the advisory committee uh, whose report I guess you may have um, voted to refer this back to the Department of Public Health. That would require resubmitting the article. So I'd like to um, propose actually you know, if depending on what we, what we, where we end up, which I think on this one will be no products at the beginning, but products will be added as DPH has capacity, so we'll allow that flexibility and staffing, um, uh, uh, could be a possibility. But so far, this this warrant article has not been modified. Um, thank you. Let me um, uh, let me get things started on select board. Uh, I know there's been um, some movement. Uh, we'll see how far it goes around. Uh, some level of PFAS ban at the at the state level. Um, maybe you can give us a little bit of information on on what's happening there and how it might uh, interplay with uh, a local ban. Would it supersede that ban? Would you know um, what is that looking like right now and the likelihood of something like that passing? As far as you can tell. So the there is a uh, interagency an interagency task force that was convened uh, last last session, I guess, to um, uh, study the issue of PFAS in Massachusetts. They just released the report, I think it was last Monday. Um, I think that's right. Anyway, last week, and we're still sort of digesting that. It did not come out with any legislative recommendations. There are the existing bills that I mentioned that these would support. Um, uh, we'll see if any of those existing bills move, but I think for a comprehensive solution, uh, more along the lines of Maine and Maryland, that won't happen until next session. But uh, these would not be in conflict with that. And as I said, some of them are taken directly from that bill. I don't know what happened if there was a conflict, but I can't imagine what the conflict would be. Uh, I don't know, it would be the date. I mean, ours would, ours, would, ours, would, ours would happen first. I mean, no one's talking discussing preemption in any of these state bills and no other local community is contemplating its own local ban yet. Okay, great. So. Um, and definitely certainly not recommending we wait until the state does something. We might be waiting a long time. If we want to do a thing, yeah, we should we do a thing. Be, we might be six feet under in some um, Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, you know, i curious to hear from board members on this. Um, it seems to me to be sensible. I, uh, the items that you've listed there, there are reasonable alternatives to them. Um, you know, I, I heard Bernard, I actually saw that same shaving cream. I did not choose it while I was there, not because I didn't even know PFAS was in it. It's and very that's convenient. Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the things cream. about um, chemicals like this. That's not, uh, uh, at least for me, not, I don't usually sort of look at the back and see, even if it is in there, I'm not even sure if it's listed in the ingredients in the back, but um, 
you know, those are some of the things that we that we buy and contribute, uh, you know, negatively to our environment and aren't even aware that we're doing it. So uh, in some cases, we need um, bands like this to save us um, from ourselves. So uh, uh, let's go Miriam and then Bernard. Yeah. I just got two words. Water pick. Okay, <laughs> Bernard. Yeah, I have a water pick too. <laughs> but it's I do use cream. Up. <laughs> it's a very good shaving uh, cream. <laughs> very good. And I get it by mail order, which brings up the question I have. Um, not mail order by, you know, Amazon or whatever. Um, is there any uh, movement at, at a federal level? Because, you know, we, we can feel good about banning it here in Brookline, but you know, people are, are going online to buy so much of their, uh, you know, goods these days that, um, you know, it, it will have limited uh, impact unless there's, you know, much broader, uh, you know, bans at, at a federal level. Um, the federal government moves... And I'm not su suggesting that we don't do anything. Yeah, no, I'm it's just, just, just to the, let you know, the federal the, government moves much more slowly than our slow state. So uh, I would not count on anything happening at the federal level anytime soon. They haven't even, they, they don't even have the water quality levels that we have in Massachusetts and in Vermont and uh, other states. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Well, no, not, not counting on it, but. Well, you know, I wouldn't it's, even, it's not even within the realm of discussion. They're way behind. All right, uh, let's hear from John. Also a reminder that this is a public hearing. So if members of the public are interested in weighing in, you're welcome to um, indicate that by raising your hand or letting us know in the Q&A or chat. Thanks very much, Clint. And, um, you know, I, I, the first reaction I had to this was just knowing that uh, Clint and uh, Dean Cody and Claire Stemper are behind it made me want to say yes, unreservedly, automatically, you got my vote. I do have a question, though. Um, has, the, has the Advisory Council on Public Health taken a, a stance on this? Yeah, that's a good question. I should have mentioned that. So uh, they voted against both 22 and 25. And I think partly out of respect for the concerns of our new Department of Health director. Um, but I'll let their report speak for themselves. I, I also want to mention, actually, I, I didn't say there was no changes yet, but the advisory subcommittee had a different recommendation. They voted in favor of it, but they wanted to make it clear that the uh, list was not... Um, that the list was finite and would be published. So there would be a published list of products as they were discovered, as the ingredients were listed, as the ingredients were analyzed, um, so that it didn't become open-ended because it, it, it includes cosmetics, which is a very broad category. And it, you know, it would just take a long time to even go through it. So- um, um, to, uh, Just to clarify, because I, I heard you mention two different committees. Uh, I mean, I, my question was about the Advisory Council on Public Health, and then you said the Advisory Subcommittee. Are you talking about an Advisory Committee subcommittee, not yes. the Advisory Yes, Council so I started with Health. the Advisory yeah. Council for Public Health, which voted no action okay. on these, well, I think it was like four to one or something, yeah. but uh, the chair was voting in favor. Because I, uh, I didn't mean that to be a trick question. I did watch the Advisory Council on Public Health meeting where this came up, to be honest. Um, I was a little bit surprised that they, um, I think unanimously, um, uh, said said no to this or, or re made no recommend either made no recommendation or chose to recommend no action on it, um, but they all expressed uh, the concern that it's unenforceable, and I, I, I bring that up just because I think that's the major argument most people are going to have to, including me, including you, are going to have to address, um, you know, as this goes forward. Um, in, in their view, it's it's like. Where do you start and where do you end? I mean, there's just so many products, and um, how would you justify taking this off the shelf but not this off the shelf when so many products um, ha have people? And who's going to do that enforcement? You know, I mean, you're going to have people from the, the virus, from the uh, board of health walking into grocery stores and taking stuff off shelves. What are we going to do? Well, in general, uh, I mean, I liked the um, clarification that the advisory subcommittee made to make this a specific finite list. So as products were discovered, they would add them to the list. So it's not a, it's not a question of gotcha, but that, you know, the biggest um, retailers for these products are pharmacies and supermarkets. So now we're talking about giant chain stores, you know, that have, uh, you know, fairly sophisticated distribution and inventory management. And they can say, oh, you know, maybe this is blocked in Brookline and we're gonna start going through this. And it starts putting them on notice nationally that, you know, this is a concern um, in addition to, you know, the other states that are putting on uh, pressure that I mentioned, like Maine and, and so forth, and Maryland. 
California. So um, it's just sort of doing our part here in Massachusetts to, to sort of get things going and maybe hopefully push the uh, state legislature because it often is the case that local action has to precede state level action. You know, we've seen that with plastic bags and styrofoam where we're a leader. Those haven't been passed at the state, even though it's been 10 years. So uh, it's important, you know, as a, as, a, as a pretty large community in Massachusetts to, to, be, to take our, our own initiative. But uh, we, you know, I was, again, cognizant of, of public health's, you know, limitations, and, and that's why I chose products that were really primarily focused in those retail outlets. Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I, that, that one is a little bit confusing to me because we, um, we enforce the plastic bag ban, which has a, a much wider universe of folks, including restaurants and others that could potentially um, use plastic bags. And this is a much smaller universe, it seems to me, of, of grocery stores and, and supermarkets where um, we can work with, with managers to inform them about the changes and, and help sort of, um, you know, as far as we know, especially if we have a very finite list of um, uh, of products to make sure that they're not being carried by the, I, I just don't, I, maybe I'm missing something about why we think it would take, um, and maybe you're not the right person, Clint, to answer this, but uh, somebody else's, but why we think it would, um, it would be that much more significant of a, um, uh, of a charge for our staff to, um, to manage this, but um Yes, I don't know if anybody from public health is here with us today to, to weigh in on that. But it's just based yeah. on the number of products. I mean, yeah, yes, plastic bags, but that's plastic bags. That's it. You know, um, yeah. Oh, great. That's actually who I wanted to hear from. I'm glad she's here. Um, so Sigal Reese, our public health director, being promoted. Um, you're here. You're welcome to. Uh, there you go. All right. Talk to me because um, your perspective on this is, is really important to us. Yeah, thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Sagari's public health director. Um, yeah, this is definitely it was a challenging list 22 and 25 for uh, ACPH and the department because the intent of them, we definitely agree with. We all want to reduce exposure to PFAS. Um, I think some of the difficulties come in is that they're really in the, in the version of the bylaw, there isn't, um, or the article, excuse me, there isn't a defined list and there's large categories such as cosmetics. Some of them we don't even know if they have PFAS or not. Um, so just defining the list of, of items is a challenge. And then it comes to the enforcement and just the capacity within the department to do it. Um, I, I don't feel like we have a good assessment of the retailers that have these products. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is some you know, environmental scans with maybe community groups to see what type of products are out there. This again, sort of the same article for 25 and 22 with the single use plastics and the PFAS just um, understanding what products are out there, what, what type of volume, what kind of alternatives they have, get buy-in from the businesses that sell them. And also just the, um, sorry, the noise in the background, um, the difficulties of enforcement. We have somebody that is 19 hours a week to do the existing um, plastics and the plastic bag and containers. Um, and we struggle to, to be able to, to enforce those and to really are, to meet our the existing capacity of, the, of what we have to enforce right now. So adding on top of it, um, we just don't have the personnel to, to do it. All right, that was really helpful. I, I think I think key to this, because um, you know I, I think this goes to town meeting and I think it does pass. I think key to this is town meeting understanding that also what they're asking for is, um, is enforcement here as well and to make sure that the resource are there for enforcement. So, um, I, you know, it's good that we're voting on this in the same um, meeting or we're voting on the budget that people are very, mm -hmm conscious of the impact that um, something like this will have on the budget too, because it seems like it needs to. Yeah. Miriam. Um, so this question is actually for you, Sagal. Um, so would it be better, for lack of another word, for you or your department if there were a more prescribed list, or would it be better if there was actually no list and it was up to you or the department to make the list? I would say the latter, because then we could sort of do that groundwork and that research. And I'm actually thank the petitioners because I myself as a consumer have had lots of questions around this and just knowing, and I think I've, I've heard from the board, knowing what products have PFAS and don't is, is a difficult decision. We you know there's clearly some products that, that we know and that are easy that you know could fall right on that list, but there's other products that we need to do a lot of research on. So I've already committed to get uh, an intern this summer to sort of start a consumer education because regardless whether this warrant article passes or not, I think that's a, a great public health mission to do. And we would have to do it as sort of the groundwork 
um, for a policy like this. So just but to directly answer your question, I think not having a list would be um, the most helpful and then we can work to create um, a list that can be enforced. And I have a follow-up to you, Clint, then. It sounds like you're amenable to making those edits. So I just want to clarify that yeah. you, yeah. And actually, for the other change we did uh, agree to after uh, our first round of discussion with uh, Seagal was to move the deadline from January 1st of next year to July 1st. But again, we, we, we'd be open to moving to December 31st, you know, if we could, you know, if that, if that would work better. So um, yes, I'm amenable to an empty uh, Warren Article 22, uh, you know, and that I think we've already seen some benefits from uh, the education around some of these products. And those three that I mentioned were, are actually from Brookline stores. So just as an example. <laughs> I could I could support it with those changes. You know, I yeah. think that's, thanks. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. I, I love a good compromise. And especially when we can get our petitioners and our staff on the same page, it's, it's terrific. Um, it also puts us in a position where um, we can actually uh, amend and update that list without having to wait um, and go through a lengthy warrant article process in the future um, to update that list. So that's good news. Um, yeah, it uh, would require a public hearing. So that's uh, for, before the select board so that you would be the ultimate arbiter in this case, or at least that's the way the advisory uh, committee subcommittee right. did it. but. Okay. Hey, we love a good. Somebody wanted that on fire. We love that. a good public hearing here. And speaking of, <laughs> well, this know, is I, a public I say, hearing. So you know, I, I'm looking let me... forward to see how many people uh, show up in support of Cremo, you know, shaving. <laughs> right, the Cremo crowd. <laughs> um, uh, so <laughs> let's. <laughs> That's why I don't say it again. Well. It's good. That's why it works so well. It's uh, best. All right. So this is a public Pardon? hearing. Um, Devin, do we have anybody that yeah. would, from the public that would like to weigh in here? The first person signed up for public comment is Mary Sabolsi. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Welcome back, Mary. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to see you all again, just moments later. <laughs> and I will be seeing you one more time um, with respect to uh, more in Article 23. Um, I hope that you all received the um, letter and attached document that from Claire Stamfer and myself. Uh, Claire actually suggested that I read it into the minutes, but I am just going to uh, summarize it briefly because I think it would take more time. Uh, Claire is, as you all know her fairly well, is a retired MD subspecialized in rheumatology. I am a retired MD subspecialized in infectious diseases. I also have a master's in public health and biostatistics and epidemiology. And in fact, the, my greatest professional accomplishment was leading a uh, arm of a stage three clinical trial uh, that um, saved the lives of eight persons of color in the state of Massachusetts with multi-drug resistant HIV. Um, actually not even HIV, AIDS. They all had AIDS and six of those individuals were in uh, the Department of Corrections at the time that they were enrolled in the trial. So that was a very exciting thing in my life. So I have a scientific background and a medical background. Uh, what I would say is um, I think that the scientific, I wanna talk about PFAS here and then that is gonna bridge to the discussion on turf. I think, and I don't wanna overstate this, but I think in terms of the medical community, the public health community and the scientific community, it is, abundantly clear that these chemicals are dangerous. They um, accumulate in the environment, um, they are toxic, they cause cancer, they cause developmental problems, they cause reproductive problems, uh, they affect fish, wildlife, and humans, and um, they are difficult to remove, if, if at all removable. Uh, the report that Clint mentioned, just so you know, which was attached to the, um, the email um, that, Claire and I, that um, Claire and I sent out, um, is a recent report published on the Massachusetts Interagency uh, Task Force on the study of PFAS. What they recommended, they didn't re recommend specific legislation, but what they recommended is that PFAS as a class of chemicals, anything with a carbon fluorine bond, be eliminated. So now that's a, that's a big, there are a lot of, of items that contain this. And so I think that's where public health and Seagal come in. 
Um, I would strongly okay. advocate. 30 seconds. Okay, I would strongly advocate for um, increasing the uh, the, the position in Skull's department from a half-time position, position uh, to a full-time position. Um, I feel like there will be more of, as we address climate change, there will be more of these um, issues coming up um, and likely we will need more personnel. And I think that this would be an appropriate time to increase those hours. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Naomi Schweitzer. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Naomi Schweitzer, town meeting member, um, Precinct 10. Uh, thank you so much for the to the petitioners uh, for bringing forward uh, this warrant article. Um, and overall, um, I am supportive and I um, applaud the um, public health director for thinking about jumpstarting a, um, a education campaign around it. But I do have some concerns and questions um, that I hope that the petitioners um, can address. Um, and as we think about the timeline uh, for potential implementation of this, uh, thinking about um, other people in town who might wanna be consulted. Uh, specifically, I'm concerned for um, our residents who um, are lower income or who may have particular health needs or transportation needs that may um, make some of the replacement products uh, prohibitively expensive uh, for them. And so while we wanna move uh, towards this, uh, not every household um, has the ability uh, to afford uh, some of the replacement products often, um, which tend to be um, you know, under the, the, you know, the banner of organics and things like that, not all, but um, some. And so for local residents who um, may be, uh, you know, only able to get to our local convenience stores and our local grocery stores um, on foot or bike and don't have access to a car, um, to get to stores in other areas where they may be seeking out the current products that are available that unfortunately have these harmful products um, or chemicals in them, but are less expensive, um, they end up in a bind um, and they have to start making choices between uh, paying the rent and having enough diapers for their babies. Um, so I'm just curious what the petitioners um, have been thinking about in terms of how to mitigate um, the impact um, of this Warren article on some of our vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Deborah Brown. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah Brown. Uh, I'm a town meeting member. I'm on the board, or I guess I'm the president of the board of the Brookline Improvement Coalition. And uh, in a former life, uh, I spent 30 years working on environmental protection issues. One of the last big issues that, that seemed to come up was, was the whole issue of, uh, I just say, chemi chemicals uh, in our lives and just how ubiqu ubiquitous they are. And, and I, overall, I'm supportive of, 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 of what Clint's trying to do. Uh, and I don't know that I've heard anybody talk about endocrine disruptors yet and, and, and how they bioaccumulate. And the, the people that tend to suffer most with these things are children. They're children and they attack organs, they attack the brain. It's and you can say, well, how often does this happen? Well, you know, uh, we don't do enough research to really know. And so uh, I, I, I'm in favor of limiting chemicals as much as possible. Uh, I, I would also like to point out that, you know, one little step can, can change people. You know, the whole uh, air emissions, vehicle air emissions was changed because it, it started with small steps and the automobile industry said, dang, well, so-and-so is doing this, then the state of California is doing it. Then they decided that they needed to change. Um, 
we, you know, ultimately we're, we're talking about not knowing how many lives are lost or how many children cannot really function to their full potential because of their exposure. And I would argue their needless exposure to chemicals. So uh, I'm supportive. Thank you. At this time, there are 12 attendees virtually and one in person. And no one has used the hand raiser Q&A feature to indicate they'd like to make a comment. OK, thank you. I'm going to close the, um, the public comment period here for this. Uh, and um, let me see. Clint, we had one question there from, um, from Naomi Schweitzer. Maybe you can, um, can respond to that. And uh, we'll see if anybody else has on the board has to say anything about this and if we want to take a vote. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you, Naomi, for bringing that issue up. That issue has actually come up um, with respect to glide floss because it, it is a, a floss that works in some ways better than others because of its uh, PFAS slipperiness and ability to get in between teeth very tightly. Uh, this doesn't restrict uh, dentists, for example, from, from giving these away. Uh, it's only in retail stores, uh, but uh, that's one possible category that we might say, you know what, it, even though it's PFAS and we would hope that nobody would be using it because you're putting it directly in your mouth and, you know, you might, your gums might bleed and, you know, there's just, it's a really bad scenario. I think that what we're trying to do with this warrant article is really put people's health first and uh, particularly people who uh, are, are perhaps more vulnerable and don't have the luxury of, you know, sitting around and reading labels to products and and knowing what the what the ingredients mean, that, that 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 we can start to say that Brookline is protecting the community from these deadly chemicals. So when we hear Dr. Sobolski say, you know, we need to be getting rid of these, and we hear the task force saying this, it's there's almost no justification for for most of these products. I mean, there as I said, there are medical applications. There's lots of miracle products that use PFAS. They're ubiquitous, but um, uh, as the task force recommended, you know, we need to start with easily substitutable ones that are kind of consumer products, not um, not medical devices. Okay, thanks. I also think, uh, you know, she raised a good point and, and maybe um, uh, Seagal, this is something that that we might want to incorporate is, um, is a real um, economic equity analysis as we think about what products might end up on this list. If there are certain um, necessary, particularly hygiene products um, for which we might eliminate um, an entire class or, um, you know, only leave available options that are significantly more expensive to people, um, that would certainly um, disproportionately impact, um, you know, some of our underpaid uh, uh, neighbors. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I don't, Quillen, what do you think about that? Is that is that the kind of analysis that we can work into this? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, this, this Warren article, especially if we pass the empty version, puts DPH in the driver's seat, so right. that I think that they, they have the skills in terms of public health, especially from having gone through COVID and its effects and, and partnering with other um, uh, departments that may have expertise in this area and outside experts, including the ACPH. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity for that. I'm not, so I, I, I think this could be a, 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 a good solution. Right, Seagal, so you feel comfortable with that? Yeah, I think that's very helpful. I just would also add the addition of, we, we need people to do the work. No, it's, I don't wanna be a broken record on that, but, um, that this is very time consuming and we just want to make sure we have the capacity to do it effectively to do and, and address the issues that have been brought up today. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, we have the ability to vote on this and, and have our say in the combined reports tonight. Do folks feel comfortable doing that? John does. Yeah. And we're voting on the uh, amended version. Okay. Empty yeah. list. Well, actually, so this is, uh, it's really, <laughs> I guess it depends on what you want to vote. You could vote on the advisory committee, subcommittees version with the elimination of the product list, I think would be the simplest and cleanest. Um, but uh, I don't know that you've had that text presented to you. Yeah. Uh, um, a, a reminder, by the way, this is the select board's rec recommendation to town meeting. Um, it holds no <laughs> formal weight. We could simply say, hey, we're in favor of whatever <laughs> whatever empowers the, the health um, director and, and, and her office to, to make these determinations, but um, maybe it makes sense and, to and just there, have a version be, that we know, can support. Future uh, 
revisions based upon uh, feedback from the Department of Public Health. I mean, so this is this is kind of a moving um, uh, warrant article, so it right. may not be right. in its final form yet. But I think that's the form that I'm comfortable with, and and I think I guess you'd have to ask Seagal that she was comfortable with. So yeah, should have sounds seen like that it as well. Um, do you want to vote now and amend it later as necessary, or just wait till later? Just wait. Okay. All right. I always say if one of us thinks we should wait, unless um, others feel very strongly, then we can wait. Yeah. Um, just now, you, you can put in the record your position so that absolutely. You, <laughs> I, I'm very much in favor of this. I think I think there's been a really let, smart let the minutes approach. Show. Let the minutes show. Um, I, I I do encourage you all because I won't be on the board later to um, keep in mind, and maybe this can end up in the in the well, not combined reports, but supplemental reports. That notion around um, economic equity and that that analysis should be part of whatever whatever we move forward. That we should make sure that we're thinking about how this impacts people that might not have access to the lowest cost products anymore. If we do this, um, so. Um, the, <laughs> Uh, like uh, all right, we're going to move on. Um, Clint, thank you so much for that. Um, Seagal, thank you for being here for this part as well. Um, we're moving on to our, um, our next article, uh, which is Warren Article 23, the resolution on artificial turf. Um, you know, this, this Warren article actually is, is in, in close conversation with um, Warren Article 24, which we're not having a hearing on tonight, um, but we've got Clint Richmond, who's 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 moving that article. And Clint, we welcome you to participate as part of this conversation, so that um, that your voice is is heard here, not just as a as a three minute public commenter, but as as a you know uh, someone involved in this conversation. So, uh, Devin, who do we have here? Mike Toffel is with us. Uh, hey, Mike, uh, how you doing? Hi there. Good. Good to see. You. You well, um, uh, as with other uh, petitioning uh, members, uh, you have as much time as Devin has allotted to you <laughs> to talk to us about this warrant article, uh, and then um, you know let us know also where it is uh, related to either AC or other committees, and um, you know less is always more. We'll ask you questions if we have, but we've got the language in front of us. Go for it. Okay, great, thank you, uh, Mike Toffel, town meeting member, of precinct eight, and the petitioner of warrant article twenty three. Uh, just also, please note, uh, as select board members and Devin, that in the attendance list includes Alexander Vecchio, the director of Parks and Open Space, um, Aaron Shute Galantine, our DPW commissioner, uh, Seagal Reese, our health de department chair. All these folks, uh, I imagine, may be uh, uh, useful to the select board in your deliberation this evening. Um, just want to make sure everyone knows they're here. So Warren Article 23, which calls for the creation of an expert task force to put together some decision guidelines around when is it appropriate to use synthetic turf versus when is it appropriate to use natural grass for athletic fields. We're talking only about athletic fields. Um, and it asks that that work be done over the summer uh, so that it is available, work product is available this fall. Uh, that aggressive timetable is created exclusively, and this whole resolution is really created exclusively in response to Warren Article 24. I'm not sure why you're not talking about 24, because it is so intricately linked, but I guess you'll talk about it anyway. Um, 24 calls for an immediate moratorium, three-year moratorium on the installation of new synthetic turf, which most urgently would affect the under construction Driscoll School. Um, and the Driscoll School has basically until this fall to pivot away, if it, if it is required to, from the synthetic turf field that its multi-year public process has yielded in its plans. So it is currently planned to have a synthetic field much like the Ridley School. Large school, small field, similar situation. Uh, like it's going to have organic infill, uh, just like Ridley Field, not crumb rubber, which has been a long-term health concern uh, with athletic fields. So, uh, so that's why it's setting this aggressive timetable. The reason why I think we would need an, an expert panel is really because when I read the explanation 
and of the petitioners of Warrant Article 24, I was concerned uh, in a number of ways. I was concerned that uh, what seemed to me facts were being mixed with opinion and science was being mixed with advocacy. And that leads to not really the best uh, fertile ground for policymaking. And so what I wanna do is get all the facts on the ground so that policymakers can make decisions based on a clear understanding of what are facts, what are opinions, what is science, and what is advocacy. Let's strip it all apart. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. The, the premise in the original of some of the arguments were comparing uh, synthetic turf to the type of natural grass that you would see that athletic uh, on athletic fields of professional sports. So they are describing professional sports athletes prefer natural grass. Well, that is a complete non sequitur to what we have in Brookline. If you look at the natural grass fields adjacent, especially to our schools, they're in quite poor shape despite the best efforts of our staff because they get such intensive use. So for many of those fields, the question, like Ridley, the comparison is, synthetic turf or compacted dirt with a little bit of grass sprinkled in. That's the reality. Um, heat island effects are discussed. Heat island effects are mostly studied by, uh, uh, most of those studies are done on crumb rubber infill turf, which absorb crumb rubber, black ground up tires, absorbs a lot of heat. Uh, so those are not necessarily the best uh, indicators of what uh, heat island effect looks like for a field like Ridley and what would be on, on Driscoll. Um, moreover, heat island effect, the concerns are it becomes unplayable uh, on very hot summer days. Uh, but if you look at the bigger picture, synthetic fields can be used, and this is according to Parks and Open Space Analysis, can be used 2,000 hours a year versus the natural grass uh, should be used in order to maintain natural grass a mere 640 hours a year, one third of the playtime. So we have an over demand, if, you, if you've referenced the athletic parks master plan, the athletic field master plan done by our parks and open space committee, they have very clearly said, we have a huge demand for our fields and they're programmed and used casually all the time, which is why we can't possibly in many of these fields maintain natural grass as natural grass. And that's why they're in such poor shape. It's a multifaceted problem with, as I describe in the warrant article. Um, it's got environmental concerns, there's economic concerns, there's play, playability, um, and, and there's um, lots of different concerns that should all be, again, brought to bear with facts and analysis. PFAS, is indeed a really important environmental and health concern, which uh, we've just been talking about a bit. Um, and you received a letter from um, Ms. Sibolsi and, uh, and Claire, uh, where they point out that PFAS is an important concern, but missing from their letter and missing from the Massachusetts PFAS report are links between the PFAS problem, which is largely a drinking water problem, and turf fields. And so people are gonna say PFAS is a problem in drinking water. And by the way, we do know now know that there's residual PFAS on the blades of synthetic fields. How much a problem that is, I don't think we know. Uh, I have not seen any peer reviewed science that really clarifies that. So we need to figure that out. We need advice from toxicologists. We need advice from a whole variety of experts that's what this moratorium, that's what, excuse me, that's what Warrant Article 23 seeks to do in time for, temp, for a fall town meeting where we can have an opportunity there to shift away if we decide to intervene in the, in the Driscoll building project. The ACPH, which weighed in against this, uh, doesn't themselves, it's not comprised of toxicologists, they are medical doctors, but they don't necessarily have the expertise that's required. Um, so uh, I think they were taking a precautionary approach based on their being medical doctors, but I think we need to avail ourselves of the proper expertise. You asked about what the status is across the various groups. The school committee favors 23, the AC favors 23, Parks and Rec Commission favors 23, um, and only the ACPH voted against 23 
largely uh, in their report and in the discussion because they felt the, the timeline uh, of being able to do this over the summer is way too short. And I will say the timeline is only this short because Warren Article 24 seeks to impose an immediate moratorium. If Warren Article 24 did not exempted Driscoll or said, let's impose a moratorium in two years, we would have a lot more time to do this study. But it is 24 that is pushing the 23 time timeline. The final thing I'll say is there's, there's some inherent contradiction in 24. On the one hand, it's predicated on the idea that PFAS in turf is so terrible that we should not advance, allow any new fields to be built, notably Driscoll. On the other hand, it allows uh, renewals of two of our existing turf fields, which would happen this year and in the next few years. So either it's terrible and we should rip it out of Ridley and rip it out of Downs and rip it out of Skyline, or maybe we're not so sure it's terrible and we need some time to think about this before we change course. So with that, I'm here available for questions. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. All right, thank you, um, Mike. So let's um, let's hear from members of the board on this. And um, we also, as a reminder, this is a public hearing, so we'll hear from members of the public as well. Um, I do wanna say, it seems to me that, um, that the debate on this Warren article should be whether or not um, we think uh, more study is required or not, and, and the timeline and things like that. I don't know that this is a, a, a debate necessarily, uh, although others may disagree. Um, we have another Warren article where there may be a direct debate about the various merits of, of artificial versus gra grass, but, um, but really this is a, a, a process Warren article. And so um, anyway, that's my pitch to maybe focus, um, keep this, uh, this conversation focused. John. Hey, Mike, um, thank you very much for the work you've done on this article. And um, I'll you know, specify right up front, uh, I favor it. Um, <clears throat> you know, as a general rule, studying these things is, is a good idea. And this is definitely something that needs study because Mike's already given us a picture of what are, what are the issues that are at stake. Um, safety, but also um, the usability of these fields, um, the use over time and whether uh, one surface treatment lasts and uh, gets greater use or uh, another surface treatment ends up, you know, depriving us of the use of the fields for considerable time. Um, however, I, I, I feel like I sense a, a, a possible <laughs> contradiction in, in the paths that uh, town meeting members might take on this. Because most people have been focused on 23 and 24 as though, um, you know, it's a, one hinges on the other. Um, if we study it, then we don't want to ban it um, at Driscoll, or at least we don't want to sort of take take away the decision, um, overturn the decision to uh, have a, a turf at Driscoll. Um, but there's also a um, conflict, as I see it, with the article we just discussed, uh, which proposes to ban PFAS. And I'm just wondering if it would be um, a difficult position to say the least uh, for the town to be in to be telling stores that they have to remove uh, PFAS-based products from their shelves and yet continuing to um, add um, uh, turf that um, includes PFAS on playing fields. Do you, do you see a contradiction there? Uh, I think like many things, risks should be considered in a rational manner. We should figure out what are the biggest risks to PFAS in, and health, which again, largely as I understand it, is a drinking water issue. And if athletic fields are high on that list, then we should move away from them. If athletic fields are the thousandth thing on that list, then maybe we should focus on numbers one to 100. So I don't know the answer to the question about the other items listed in the prior article, how important those are, flossers. Is that an important contributor to the PFAS problem? I don't know. If we're gonna ban it, does it matter if it's number one or number a thousand? It matters to me and I hope it would matter to you. And if we don't know, I guess we can just randomly ban stuff that has PFAS, but that doesn't seem like good public policy making to me. Thanks for the answer. Miriam. I, I wanna piggyback on what Mike just said too. 
you know, we are comfortable making Warrant Article 22 empty and letting the public health decide. To me, he says, we don't actually know what should be on that list, which is fine. But then Warrant Article 23 does the same thing. It says, let's leave it to the experts to actually decide if turf should be on this list, rather than a group of advocates saying we should just ban it outright. Right. I'm I I think that we've gone the route of choosing a more thoughtful, mm -hmm. careful, scientific and data based approach with Warrant Article 22 and Warrant Article 23 does the same thing. So to me, those things are in alignment. Um, I have my own separate thoughts about Warrant Article 24. I will heed Raul's caution and not go there right now, but I will say that that I very much support Warren Article 23. And this is from a parent whose son literally is on Downs Field every day, Monday through Friday, three to five. So, you know, I have skin in the game, right? This is my child on turf every day, all year, because he's a three season track athlete. So. Uh, let, let me ask a question. I don't, I don't think we, I, I'm sure Melissa is over at the advisory committee now, but maybe somebody else will be able to answer this. Um, is, there, is there a scenario in which, in which 23 and 24 can both pass a town meeting? Mr. Contradictory? I, I, I can answer that if you'd so. like. Yeah, give it a shot, Mike. Yeah, they're independent articles. So yes, they can both pass. Um, there are members of, for example, the school committee who voted in favor of both, um, although the school committee itself did not vote in favor of both. Um, the a, I should say the AC made some edits to both articles, uh, to, to 23, and this is important, I had, and originally in Warren Article 23, I had um, written that the parks and open space should be the one to convene this task force under my um, understanding that uh, athletic fields are, like many fields, are under their purview and they have the expertise to figure out who would be the best group to assemble. The advisory committee motion, which is actually the only motion you have in front of you, uh, changed that to make the select board the body to convene the task force. So I do want to point that out. Um, but they also, the AC also for 24, has a motion to refer 24, the consideration 24 to the task force that would be created if 23 passes. So there is that link to answer your question, Will. But yes, town meeting, If I don't know whether the petitioners are 24. I presume they will make their own motion uh, that differs from the ACs. And if the petitioner's motion passes under 24, we could have a moratorium under 24 and a study group under 23, and they both could live. Under that scenario, the timetable for 23 can be more relaxed because, it, well, maybe it could be more relaxed or it can be continue to be aggressive with the possibility of town meeting or others overturning the moratorium in the fall town meeting. Interesting. All right, thank you. That was actually a really helpful response, at least for me. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's, um, let's go ahead and go to public comment. Um, so let's open the public hearing, hear from the public, and then we'll, we'll see what the board is thinking about it. The first person signed up for public comment is Mary Sabolsi. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your three minutes will begin. Hi, Dr. Sabolsi again. Nice to see you all. Um, Welcome I, back. Uh, you, know I've si you know I signed up. I, I raised my hand right away because I want to get to dinner. <laughs> so um, I urge the uh, members of the select board to please look at the letter uh, that Claire Stanford and I sent to you. Um, it did take us four versions back and forth to write this letter because we wanted to be extremely precise. Um, I would like to also uh, point out to you that um, Deborah Brown's comments on the previous warrant article do apply here. Yes, PFAS chemicals among their many uh, adverse health effects include endocrine effects. I would like to uh, clearly state uh, the adverse health effects of artificial turf. 
In addition to PFAS exposure, there is exposure to other organic chemicals such as benzene, which cause leukemia, as well as other known carcinogens. Heavy metals, including but not limited to mercury, mercury, lead, and arsenic, which cause a wide variety of toxicologic syndromes. Heat island effects, which occur irrespective of the color of the plastic blades and the type of infill material. These effects are sufficient to make many fields unusable during the summer, and this effect must be factored in when usable time is calculated. Skin and soft tissue infections with methicillin staphylococcus aureus. I can attest to this as having seen many cases of these very serious soft tissue infections during my uh, time in clinical practice. This, this, uh, the fact that this uh, very aggressive bacteria can grow on these blades requires that the turf be sprayed with biocides which also in themselves have potential adverse impacts as well. And then there is the risk of orthopedic injuries in both professional and student athletes. All of these risks have been documented in peer reviewed scientific literature. Um, the opinion as I understand it, and I hope that Seagal will be able to clarify this as well, of uh, the ACPH was that um, they did want a period of study. They felt three months was a completely unreasonable period to study this issue. You have 30 seconds. And they, and they voted in favor of Warrant Article 24 with the hopes that during the moratorium, time would be available for study. Um, I would like to point out that you cannot do a study if you already have a foregone conclusion. That is not the way the scientific process works. And it seems to me that Warren Article 23 is asking for a study with a foregone conclusion. Thank you. I mean, in, in all respect, because if you had to conduct these kinds of studies, Mr. Tovel, which I believe you have not necessarily had to do, but I could be wrong, uh, but having spent many years conducting scientific study, I can tell you that I've never conducted a study in a three-month period of time. Thank next, you very much. The next person signed up for public comment is Andrew Fisher. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and your time will begin when you're ready. Okay. Uh, I'm unmuted. Let me go. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I speak as a co-petitioner who was concerned um, about the safety and about the environmental impacts and about the climate change impacts of um, plastic artificial uh, playing fields. And it seems to me, and I support the the stated intention of doing a study, but it seems that the timing is backwards, that you don't put into place something that's costly, that, and Mr. Tofel can tell you better than me what, uh, what it will cost to install this, what it will cost to remove it if it turns out that, the, that he's wrong and the studies show that, that this is toxic and as all scientific evidence so far has shown, um, is a hazard to uh, climate change, is a hazard to the children who use it. Um, and I think that um, Select Board Member Van Skoyek, uh, his skepticism is, is well-placed. Um, the timing is really critical. Mr. Tofel is correct. The timing is absolutely critical. And you don't decide to study something after you've paid for it and and incurred the obligation to pay to remove it if you're wrong. You study it before you before you jump off the diving board. You look at how liquid the water is in the pool. Um, the purpose of the moratorium is to do just that. Uh, I think the burden on the Board of Health 
and on the volunteers who are going to have to make this analysis. There's no way that they can do this in time. This is an effort to get this turf field done before we know what the impact is. And I think the, mentor, the purpose of 24 is absolutely consistent with the intended purpose of the study, of the study. Uh, but we need to do the study before we, before we act on what we don't know the study will find. Uh, and in that sense, there's a consistency between Article 23 and Article 24. Uh, Article 23 is dangerous without Article 24. Maybe I'm wrong, but if I'm wrong, there's no harm done. If yeah. I'm not wrong, we've spent a lot of money for something that's very dangerous that we're going to have to spend more money to undo. You have 20 seconds. Thank you. The next person signed up for public comment is Mike Sandman. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute uh, and your three minutes will begin. Thank you. Uh, Mike Sandman, town meeting member of Precinct uh, 3. Um, I spent, uh, uh, I speak as somebody who spent 25 years in the industrial chemical and industrial textiles industry exposed to uh, all sorts of toxic products. And as far as I can tell at this stage of my life, uh, they may have caused baldness, but there doesn't seem to be anything else that's a factor. The question is the level of exposure. And I would say that there's a huge difference between the exposure level that uh, people uh, uh, incur if they're using uh, cookware, for example, that uh, has PFAS uh, chemicals, uh, Teflon in it, uh, or perhaps wearing garments. Uh, a huge difference between those exposures uh, and the kind of exposure that uh, kids have even when they're playing on, on a playing field. Uh, there's a certain amount of outgassing that certainly occurs when uh, plastic products are new. Uh, once that uh, dissipates, the, um, there's uh, probably very, very little exposure. But um, let's take a look uh, at, at studies that deal with that particular form of exposure rather than uh, at uh, studies that look at the impact of these products uh, in, the, uh, in the food chain uh, or in the water supply. Okay. Um, so, um, and Mike, I want to give you an opportunity to respond here. Um, would you like to do that before or after we hear from Clint? Uh, I'll let me do it after because there may be additional thing Clint raises that I want to respond. Sure thing. To. Um, <laughs> hey, Clint, how you doing? Welcome back. Thank you. All right. So, what are you thinking about this? Is there um, is there any room to to move these um, these articles closer together, or are they in conflict with with one another? What do you think? <laughs> uh, Clint Richmond, town meeting member, precinct six. Um, I think some of our goals are the same. I think the reason for uh, uh, first of all, I said I've been trying to raise the issue of PFAS and turf since I first discovered that uh, Driscoll was going to be turf, which was June of last year, and, uh, and have not had enough success. So I felt that the only way I could do that was to bring one article 24. So the, the, the timeline is much longer than, um, than just this Warren article. Um, the other thing is that um, there's a difference between school playgrounds and athletic fields and that at Ridley, which has a tiny bit of grass, um, like uh, the proposed Driscoll, is forcing school children to play on a plastic playing field. And as Dr. Savolsi mentioned, it's not just the PFAS, but the PFAS is the new information that was not available and was not discussed and, uh, uh, during the Driscoll field selection uh, process. But I agree that there's lots of other chemicals uh, in, involved with these. And part of the problem with these, much like the consumer products we were just mentioning a few minutes ago, is that uh, there's no disclosure. The fact that PFAS is in turf was discovered by independent scientists. The manufacturers never revealed it. Their consultants have recently confirmed it, but, uh, and, and there's been a lot of focus on the, on the blades, but there is PFAS and in, 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 has been tested in, and found in other components, but not, we still don't even have the information about Brookline's own fields. So it's a very difficult problem. And I think the crumb rubber is a cautionary tale that we believe that crumb rubber uh, was okay. And we believed in the advantages of turf and we installed it and now we regret it and we're taking it out. 
but it's not going away and it's not going away very quickly. And our athletes will be playing on crumb rubber uh, in other, when they play uh, uh, away games. But it's, I think it's unfair to expose school children in particular to who are, who are vulnerable developmentally without choice to uh, these, all these chemicals. And uh, parents just don't have the, the, the choice and, and they shouldn't need to be a, a, some sort of super scientist to figure out whether it's safe to play on their own fields. You know, we just, none of these issues uh, uh, occur with grass. And, the, and introducing a heat island in a neighborhood that has only two parks, one of which is Driscoll, so they'd be taking, taking one out of the game and replacing it with a heat island is a town-wide decision and it's completely independent of the PFAS. As far as the select board is concerned, uh, you've had two of your committees uh, 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 support Warren Article 2024, ACPH and SWAC. And their voices had not been consulted during, again during the selection process. So, you know, what this Warren article is trying to do is lift up the voices that haven't been heard. We've heard a lot from the athletic community and the recreation community, and those are important uh, constituencies, and I support them, and, and my family has been part of those as well. And I grew up with those, but, you know, we didn't have turf fields back then, thank God, but um, back in the old days. Uh, so uh, I, I urge you to heed the advice of, of two committees that... <laughs> I, I, I don't want to call them, I, I would challenge anyone who calls them unqualified about these recommendations. I just don't think that we're going to be able to assemble experts. I mean, the PFAS task force for the state took several months. They, they had access to lots of experts. And I don't think that, you know, we have the resources to, to make any meaningful new contribution to this question in terms of the environmental and health effects of this, uh, of this, of this product. So uh, I guess a couple other things I'd say in closing are grass is reversible. We can install sod at Driscoll and install turf later if it doesn't work out. Um, both articles can pass, but DPW and DPH are not the sponsors of this Warren article. And they ask a lot of staff and of our volunteers. And, and, and PFAS is a hell of a lot more than a drinking water issue. Our state department of public health has issued fish advisories for, for, for ponds on the Cape where people have been eating the fish and they're so exposed uh, uh, that uh, they're saying, don't, don't eat this fish or don't eat it in certain amounts. And like the floss, the turf comes into direct contact with the skin. If you cut yourself and, and you know, it's easy to slip and slide on turf and, and you get uh, turf abrasions, you're coming in direct contact with PFAS and the other chemicals. And finally, I sent a, 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 an unpublished paper that was just presented this month at a conference, a very prestigious conference here in Massachusetts by one of the world's leading experts on PFAS called PFAS and Artificial Turf. And just the fact that we're even having such uh, uh, that kind of um, paper as a topic at a, at, a, at a conference on PFAS, the science of PFAS is just astonishing. And I think we, you know, like, like uh, uh, <laughs> with, with 22, we, we want to avoid PFAS wherever we can because it's cumulative. Remember, it never goes away and there's thousands of forms so we're never gonna we're never gonna have time to catch up, even if we had full disclosure. So uh, I personally, I I don't I don't think we need 23, but I think that you know study will con continue. We can build on what we've already done, and um, I urge you to vote favorable action on Warren Article 24. All right, thanks, Clint, for your time. Uh, we're gonna go to Mike, and let me just say this before we do, as we approach uh, 9:30. Um, I, you know, I think this is certainly one we're not doing the public hearing for Warren Article 24 tonight. Um, I, I don't know that it makes any sense for the board to vote tonight when um, we're gonna have this. We would have this board vote uh, of these four folks vote on this article, and then later on. Um, uh, another board member that's not me be on the board and Heather Hamilton, the chair, be back and vote separately on, on another warrant. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know if others feel differently about that. But um, so just know that, Mike, as you as you make your um, now what we'll call your closing comments. And um, and I know Miriam has something to say, but let's go to Mike first. An additional public. Comment. Oh, actually, Mike, would you mind uh, if we just yep. heard from one more person from the public? Sure. Yep. The next person signed up for public comment is Regina Frawley. You've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video if you're comfortable. Your three minutes will begin. Yes, good evening. I just have two very brief comments. One, whatever happened to erring on the side of caution? I, I agree with the scientists who've spoken so far. But the other thing that hasn't been mentioned, Andy Fisher talks about the cost of installing grass of artificial turf and then disposing of it 
removing it, he said. But we all know that it's really about where do you have to pay to send out where to now? Ohio, um, Canada, we have been sending out anything toxic out of state, and that is prohibitively expensive. And we have lots of examples of that historically in Brookline over the last 20 years. So I do want to put that on your radar screen that you make a mistake going forward, it's going to be much costlier than just installing and removing it. It's a dis dispensing with it is the real cost. Thank you. And thank you. I'm going to go ahead and close um, the public hearing right now. Let's hear from Mike, and then um, we have other business to attend to. Mike. Oh, I'm thanks. sorry. Yes. Um, thanks, Ralph. Uh, Mike Toffel, town meeting member, precinct eight, petitioner of Article 23. Uh, so the comments that you just heard, I think, hopefully illustrate the complexity of this issue. Um, you've heard without given been given any peer reviewed science that there's heavy metals at play. As far as I know, the heavy metal issue uh, with synthetic turf is in the crumb rubber, uh, which is not being used at Ridley. And the fact the town has moved away from using crumb rubber, it wouldn't be used at at, at uh, Driscoll either. Um, you heard the idea that a study can't possibly be conducted in three months with the question of whether I've done any such studies. I think there's some confusion there. This is not, my task force does not create any new scientific peer-reviewed studies. That I think the word study is being mis misunderstood. What it is tasked with doing is sourcing the work that's been done, going through it, see what's actual science and what is opinion, what is advocacy and what is not. That, how can that not be possible to be done in three months, right? Especially when, when some people think it's so clear. Well, then this task force would just need a couple of weeks. I don't think it's so clear. So I think a couple of months is actually a more appropriate time scale. Um, is PFAS in turf the next crumb rubber? Maybe, but maybe it's the next fluorinated water, which also engendered lots of concerns in its early days and turned out to be unwarranted. So this is why we need some studies. It's interesting to note that uh, the PFAS uh, report created by Massachusetts, which according to others who spoke tonight, took many, mo many months based on expertise, it doesn't have the word turf in it. If turf is such an important contributor to the PFAS problem, wouldn't the word turf be in that report or grass or something? It, I don't know. Um, seems to me this is like what you've heard, all the arguments you've heard tonight, to me, seem actually more evidence that we need to take some time and think it through and do the analysis. The charge that I have a predetermined outcome is, I have to say, preposterous on its face. I am calling for a study to be done to pull the facts together in time for fall town meeting so that our policymakers can make a more informed decision. How that could possibly be misconstrued as being a predetermined outcome is just beyond me. So I'll conclude saying, some have said I am a turf advocate. I, in this article, am a evidence-based policymaking advocate. So if you believe that our public policy, which needs to think about competing risks, should be based on information, the best information we can gather, I would encourage you to vote yes on Ward Article 23. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Miriam. Yeah, I promise, Raul, I'll keep it short. So there's, there's two things. The first, I'm going to say that there's another set of voices here that matter, and that's parents' voices. We're in Article 24, which we're not discussing, is a direct shot at Driscoll. And those parents spoke up during the public process, there was one, and they spoke up again when we had we rehashed the turf debate at the behest of Clip and Clint and Andy. So the parents were very, very clear. 
Okay, and they're informed. They're not. They they know all the. They know all there is to know. Clearly, there is more for us to know, which is why I support Warren Article Twenty Three. That said, I would love to hear briefly from Erin Galantine on what she thinks. Thank you. All right, Erin, you're you're still up and with us. Um, so you know we should make use of your time. So welcome back. Let's get you up here. Uh, Commissioner Galantine. Good evening, Aaron Hugh Galantine, Commissioner of Public Works. Um, and thank you to um, you know the petitioners, frankly, of both 23 and 24 for your um, thoughtful work on all of this. Uh, specific to 23, um, this subject matter does merit uh, study. And the petitioner uh, has put together a very thorough list of criteria. The committee may come up with uh, additional um, study points uh, when the task force gets together. But I think the purpose of developing a policy and a decision-making rubric is really the context of this uh, of this proposal, and it, it is not sort of an in-depth um, scientific study looking for new information, but really um, pulling together all the information that's out there and helping um, synthesize it in a way that our residents and our policymakers can understand and make um, meaningful decisions and understand. Um, risk. Um, as has been discussed, Brookline has a significant and challenging uh, deficit of athletic field space uh, to serve this community and synthetic turf fields um, to date programmatically have served uh, this community well. And so um, the committee will need to look at that uh, in addition to you know, what is uh, both complex and emerging uh, information as it relates to PFAS uh, specifically. Uh, initially, when Mr. Tofel um, presented the word and article, it seemed reasonable to me that the Park and Recreation Commission would take the lead as they have done so much study and public process around um, the synthetic turf fields that we do have in town. Um, and they have had a thoughtful um, approach and analysis uh, with each of these uh, particular um, considerations. But uh, in listening to the advisory committee, further discussion with my colleagues, I think that um, this overall issue applies to multiple departments, in, including the school department. And um, for that reason, really um, does, I think, merit the broader lens of a select board task force. So um, in short, this is a complex uh, issue. It does merit study. And um, we look forward to working with our colleagues and other departments to help support this task force uh, if this passes at town meeting. All right, thanks, Commissioner. Um, thanks also to Alexandra Vecchio uh, and also um, Seagal Reese, who, um, who've, who stuck around. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on. We said we weren't going to vote on this tonight. Um, there'll be a vote on this in the future. Um, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Clint, um, and everybody else um, who joined us for this conversation. Appreciate you. All right, we have now those. Oh, and I'm closing the public hearing if I didn't already. It's, it's, it's closed or reclosed, one or the other. Uh, so now we have, um, we are done with our public hearings. We can now move to voting on <clears throat> four Warren articles that we have on our agenda. Uh, do we, um, do we have, um, Melissa joining us for this part? I'm looking for her. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that. Right. Okay. So let's see if we can get. There is. On budget? Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to grab her. She's not here yet. Yeah. I, I, right. I didn't know about Warren. Well, how about, 15. yeah, how about we, we get an update uh, from John, if you're willing, on Warren Article 15 um, on, mm -hmm. on um, you know, that being pulled. And, and if you can just let us know why, that'd be helpful while we wait for Melissa. Sure. Happy to. Um, 
So I have been chairing what's known as the Boylston Street Corridor Study Committee um, for about a year and a half and um, done a lot of work, terrific people serving on that committee. We've been meeting, uh, I would say an average of once a month, but uh, lately we've been at meeting an average of twice or three times a month. Um, and um, we've done what committees do um, under those circumstances. We've done our best to fashion a warrant article that would accomplish some zoning changes in the Boylston Street corridor from High Street to Brington Road. Um, and this is no easy task. Um, the fact of the matter is, uh, if people think, uh, gosh, I don't remember there being similar votes made in my recent memory, you're right. Um, it's not like, you know, um, on a regular basis, we come to town meeting with zoning proposals. And that's because they are, our existing zoning bylaw is very complex. Our, our zoning map is very complex. It's very hard to kind of dig into it, change it, and, um, and use the zoning bylaw that we have to as the basis for changes that will then up zone, which simply means allow for a more significant degree of development than is currently allowed under the existing um, zoning bylaw, up zone in the interest of spurring some more, we, we hope commercial development, but we also hope some more housing development. So we did our work. We, we um, got as far as we could get with the zoning article. We began the process of reviewing it preparatory to town meeting. It was looked at by the zoning um, uh, and planning bylaw committee. It was looked at by the planning board. It was looked at by a subcommittee, the advisory committee. Um, and probably most important of all, um, it was it was questioned by people in at least one particular neighborhood, the, the Brinkton Road neighborhood, who said they really, despite the best efforts of the committee, they felt a little bit blindsided and hadn't been fully aware of the impacts this would have on their neighborhood. So they put their sort of plea in for us to go back to what we had drafted and redraft. There were some people who thought other aspects of it might be improved through some redrafting. And we eventually decided, and this was done at a vote of the committee on Monday, um, that um, the best course of action is to take into consideration the various um, input that we've gotten in, in the last several weeks, give ourselves until November, um, and come back with a redrafted form of the bylaw that we hope um, will address the concerns in such a way that um, we get that. <laughs> what is one of the biggest questions of all was, do we need a two-thirds majority or a simple majority? And even that was in doubt. Um, people weren't sure which we needed, and that was not a good um, that was a, not a good uh, basis for going forward. Because if we guessed wrong and thought that a maj simple majority was sufficient, and then it was legally challenged, and it turned out it wasn't, we would have wasted our effort um, altogether. And uh, so we had a lot of reasons to uh, hold off. That was helpful. Thank you. And um, thanks, John, for, for all your work on this and your continued work on this. Um, all right. So we do have Melissa Goff with us. And um, Melissa, if you can um, join us and walk us through where we are. Um, I'm also reminded it's 943. Uh, feels like some time ago that we um, that we voted that change of manager for Barcelona. And all I can think about is stop us now. So um, was that this week? That was some, sometime. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, um, Melissa, talk to us about where we are. Um, we're in Article Eight, the budget. So we are in the thick of the advisory committee debate, and so I asked them for ten minutes to walk you through a budget motion, which may not be the same as where they land, but I can at least give you a sense of what they're debating right now. So you have um, in your packet a draft budget motion, a draft budget table a memo from me explaining some of the differences that have occurred since the town administrator's budget came out. We discussed some of that last week and some of the items that the advisory committee is considering. Um, so I, I think it would just be easy to um, just walk you through uh, the budget vote and then talk about where some of the differences lie. Right. Um, so this beginning part of the budget is uh, basically conditions of appropriation, which essentially set out um, the rules for certain expenditure um, 
what where certain expenditures can happen what, what transfers need to happen who do you do who do you need to see in order to make a transfer from personnel to services etc this is standard language that we have every year um, standard language on uh, contracts contracts and leases uh, giving the chief procurement uh, officer authority around contracts and leases um, this is around the um, salary adjustments that we provide for the uh, personal services reserve and the collective bargaining reserve. This is also annual language every year. Uh, the salary for the town clerk's budget is specified in the vote as well. Um, obviously, any additional adjustments voted by the board get applied to the town clerk as well. This is the uh, condition that allows uh, for any benefit eligible position to be authorized by the select board before it gets filled. Uh, then we have our golf enterprise budget, no change from what originally was proposed. Same thing with water and sewer enterprise fund. Um, and then we also have our rec revolving fund our, uh, and other revolving funds for building uh, repairs for rental properties, sidewalk improvements, uh, uh, facade program, copier uh, expenses in the library, and then school department. Um, this school maintenance re uh, repair is for the school plant sub program within the building department. That is an item that we did make some adjustments to. And once we go into the Excel sheet, I'll be able to kind of walk you through what those are. Um, snow and ice budget. This is uh, annually voted uh, separately every year. Uh, and then we have some transfers here um, from the cemetery and from rec revolving to support the benefits related to the operations in those departments. Um, for recreation and then to support the cemetery program within DPW. New this year is the Community Preservation Fund, and I've been going back and forth with um, both the comptroller and with David Lascoye on um, the appropriate language around the CPA. Um, so the original recommendation I had in the draft that was in your packet showed um, allocating the various um, required funds um, for preservation, open space, and um, affordable housing. We're gonna wait and defer that until the fall. Um, what we really just need is to make sure that we have some startup funds for administrative expenses. Um, and so this is the amount that we're recommending. Um, we're building a contingency in case the committee also needs some support around um, potentially hiring consultants to support their, their work. Um, not the full amount of what is allowable under administration, but we felt like it was enough to at least get us through the November town meeting. Um, then we have um, the host community funds will now be appropriated as a special appropriation. So this is the combination of all of the activities in the various departments. So health department, DPW, police, et cetera, all of those expenses are outlined in the town administrator's budget message as well. Um, item 14 is about the um, reporting that we provide to the advisory committee on a quarterly basis. And then we have all our special appropriations. And so our special appropriations are all the items of the CIP that we talked about two weeks ago when the CIP was being reviewed. Um, the only change here is that the advisory committee is looking at allocating an additional $50,000 um, coming from a dormant CIP account to support some tree planting work. Um, and then I also had town bond council review all of the language for all of the bond funded accounts and those corrections have been made in a revised version that will be um, uploaded to the combined reports. So that is, uh, and then the last section is the allocation of free cash and the recommendations around that and that is a lot of um, policy driven allocations. So that is the um, the budget language, and then we also have the budget table, which is where we'll kind of get into the meat of the discussion that we're having at advisory committee. Um, so I would say that there are some um, sticking points that are currently being discussed at advisory committee. And so if we just go by department, um, I, I'd say that it's definitely um, the school budget that is the, the high point here. We are allocating an additional Five hundred thousand uh, dollars, three three hundred going to schools and two hundred going to town. The advisory committee just rejected that. Um, they feel that they have heard a lot from town departments about needs, and they are looking to allocate the full five hundred thousand dollars to the town side of the budget. Um, our current recommendation for the two hundred thousand that was allocated to the town per the split. Uh, is to put the entire amount in the collective bargaining reserve. And um, at this point, I don't know where the AC is going to land with that. Um, 
so those are kind of the two biggest points. And then the only other adjustments that were made um, were also indicated in my memo, an additional $390,000 to the building department to support building maintenance. Uh, and then I already uh, spoke about the $50,000 um, for tree removal um, to support the coming from a dormant CIP account. So um, that is where I am with what I thought we were going to be doing, but obviously it's still in flux with the advisory committee still considering additional adjustments. Um, so what I would like to do is at least get a balanced budget voted tonight based on the recommendations um, that I had in my memo. And then if the advisory committee um, has some changes, we can react to that in two weeks. Um, so that we at least have in the combined reports going out to town meeting um, a, a budget motion um, in the event that the advisory hopefully will conclude tonight, but you just never know. <laughs> All right, thanks, Melissa. I think there's some some big issues we need to discuss here. Let me just ask you uh, about uh, sm maybe some smaller stuff first, so we can get to that and talk about the big issues. Um, one, the 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 three hundred k and the two hundred k that the advisory committee recommended. Did, um, remind us where those monies um, were slated to go. So Is that what we were using for the building department? So there's two different things that are happening. There was in the throughout the CIP process, there was three hundred and ninety thousand dollars identified as needing um, allocation because uh, three hundred and forty of it uh, was actually covered through uh, the high school project. Um, and $50,000 was an error on my part where I didn't list it in the warrant in order to um, provide funding for school mini CIP. Um, so uh, the recommendation is that the 340 plus the 50 go to the building department um, to basically make them whole. Uh, and then the uh, additional revenue adjustment is what we're currently debating at, at advisory. So we um, we've talked about the $3.3 million gap uh, that the school department had, $3 million of that being voted through ARPA, and we um, adjusted revenue in order to uh, allow for the additional $300,000 to cover their gap. Um, essentially, what we did was we um, took the Ways and Means version of the budget, um, and then we also adjusted a Medicaid uh, reimbursement fund based on some conversations with the school department about their confidence around the revenue that would be coming in through that receipt. Uh, and then a small adjustment to um, the uh, building permit uh, account as well. So uh, $500,000 applying the town school split allocation would provide 300 to the schools and 200 to the town. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. Um, one other um, uh, item and We'll talk about the bigger stuff. Uh, the um, the the racial equity uh, fund, uh, the HCA. Where where are we in terms of of um, I'm, I may have missed this in the memo that's attached to the budget, but how much we're expecting is going to go into that fund? Do we know yet? So currently for HCA, we did not have a recommendation for the racial equity fund. Um, we got the request after the budget was already voted on by the committee. Um, what I've been cautioning both the committee and the board and advisory on is the uncertainty around the future of HCA. So I think we need to have a conversation about a strategy around making sure that the current employees that are funded through the HCA are, have, a, have a, a plan for transition either to another funding source um, or um, using you know, the next year's allocation of funds to support fiscal 24 expenses um, before we talk about additional um, asks around the, the, the HCA funds. So more to come, I guess, on that one. Got it, okay. Um, and we may, I mean, you know, the we may have less need for, for some of those staff as we, as we move forward, let's, let's see. Um, so are we, are we in a position right now? I'm, I'm just going to say a word and don't don't take offense to it anyway. Are we in a position right now that we're non-committal to putting money toward the racial equity fund, or is it just a matter of figuring out exactly what that number is going to be? Well, you know, I, I think we we did um, appropriate or allocate five hundred thousand dollars. I I'm not really sure there is a plan going forward. I you know we work with the uh, the uh, HCA committee. I forget the name of it, Miriam, but. Um, uh, mitigation committee, I guess. And, and, you know, I think we look for their input. As Melissa said, we expect HCA funds to dry up uh, based on state legislative efforts. So, you know, we just don't have a plan right now. Okay. All right. Um, got it. 
Um, my only, my only comment on that would be let's come up with a plan before someone comes up with one for us through the town meeting process in the fall, um, which is, which is, I think likely to happen uh, if we don't do anything between now and then. Um, all right, let's, um, let's Miriam, let's, let's hear it. Um, um, Melissa, I need to, I need, yeah, I need some clarity that does the AC have the authority to just decide to ignore the town school partnership and regardless of that answer, let me be clear that I will not vote for a budget that just dismisses the TSP process out of hand because I don't know why. Because that's why we have that process. I'm not a huge fan of it myself, but it exists as a process. And I don't think the Financial Advisory Committee can just decide that they don't like it or they want to, super, they want to subvert it in some way. And so the, a budget with that in it will not have my support. So the advisory committee, the motion for town meeting is the advisory committee's motion. There are two members of the advisory committee on the town school partnership. Obviously, they can't speak for 30 members, um, but they have been talking about the partnership and whether it's working and what the structure should be and how to revisit it. And, you know, these are things that, you know, I think that we've been talking about at least for the past, you know, three, four years uh, on, you know, whether or not the partnership works. I think that the, the key in the partnership is that we're, it gets the conversation going so that we have certainty and, and in budgeting and, and making sure that, you know, there's not a surprise thrown at, you know, either the town or the school side when, when trying to make plans. And, and that's really the benefit of the partnership is trying to provide that, that certainty. Um, you know, I think I said to advisory that, you know, I was going to put together this motion right now for you um, that I hope that you would pass so that we at least have a, a budget motion that honors the, the re recommendations and, and commitments that we've had in conversations with the schools. Um, and if they decide that they want to go a different route, then town meeting will have to consider those choices. I mean, I just want to say to that, all of what you said is true, but I don't think that gives advisory, the financial advisory committee permission to circumvent invent the process we need to still fix it but it's not all out of hand just for them to decide what they like or don't like and take what they want to take or not take i will say it was a close vote hmm. and likely not over <laughs> as always that uh john <clears throat> on that subject um can we get a little clarification as to, because um, uh, I'm a little confused as to exactly what the advisory committee did vote to do. I do know that there's been a background discussion, um, which is an important one to have, um, that uh, focuses on school facilities and the question of whether town side or school side is responsible for some of the upgrades, maintenance, routine maintenance, um, uh, that needs to be done so that facilities don't deteriorate. And within that discussion, there hasn't really been um, a settled uh, agreement, as far as I know, um, to deal with things like, well, we're $15 million behind on things we should have done to improve the condition of some, some school facilities. Whose responsibility is that? Should that be money that comes out of the revenues allocated to the schools, or is that money that should be spent by the building department out of revenues that um, um, exist on the municipal side? So if there are people, is the essence of this that there are people on the advisory committee who are saying, if the schools aren't going to address these needs, then we're going to keep some of the money on the town side so that the building department can can address these needs is, is that's not what's going on no so the, the advisory committee feels that they've made an allocation with the building department that um meets the request that charlie made for fiscal 23. i think what they are trying to um decide is of the additional revenue that we've identified the the state aid and local receipt re receipt re adjustments um, whether or not any of that should go to the schools. They, they basically voted the school-based budget. So that means that there's $500,000 that typically would have been allocated 300 school, 200 town, that now they are saying the whole 500 should stay on the town side and we're going to figure out where that should go. Well, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that at the end of the day, 
say, they're going to say, and we want it to go to some of these school facilities that need um, improvements and need need upgrades. Because yeah. I'm, I mean, the people I, I've been hearing discuss this on the advisory committee, that's what they're focused on. No, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about a planning position. They are talking about code enforcement position. They are talking about vehicles in the police department, and they are talking about collective bargaining. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Miriam. Can I bring an alternate motion to, ref to this budget to reflect that we want the TSP to be honored? Well, so Miriam, I mean, sorry, I Melissa. Mean, I don't know. I don't know how to. How yeah, to Melissa, what, Melissa. What, what would happen if, if the board disagrees with, with, um, with what the advisory committee is doing or has done? What would that look like either now in our board meeting or later in going to town meeting? So if you wanted to uh, allocate the additional revenue per the recommendations of the town administrator, I would recommend that you vote the budget that we put in front of you, which essentially grew the school department by $300,920 and put the town allocation of $200,000 into the collective bargaining reserve, which okay. is represented on the budget table. Mm. All right. Thanks, Mel. But I do, I do want to clarify, as, as Melissa said, it is the advisory committee's motion that will go before town meeting. So to the extent that you will eventually have a dis disagreement, you would have to pr pr uh, propose, a, or propose an amendment to the budget. Got it's it. their main motion. But, but, but that happens from time to time. And I, I think you know, we'll, we'll have a town school partnership meeting soon where probably it all, all, all come out. Okay. Uh, uh, other questions on the budget? Okay, um, so um, we have uh, a recommendation in front of us, uh, unless anyone feels, you know, I, I'm happy to move um, the recommendation from the town administrator on the budget. Um, John? Yeah, I'm sorry, I thought of a question that I meant to ask and I hadn't asked it yet. Um, is there anything in this budget that if approved is gonna commit the town to a considerable expenditure later? And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, because there's a lot of um, discussion of whether ultimately there's going to be needed um, an additional engine company um, or ladder company. I'm not even sure which. I think it, it actually might be ladder um, in the fire department, um, which has personnel consequences. It would, it would presumably mean also adding 20 positions to the fire department budget. So if we end up purchasing the extra piece of equipment, then we need a bay for it to be garaged. Then we need to add the 20 people. And so we've effectively made the decision as to the future and to and those commitments by buying the piece of equipment. Is there anything like that in the budget? I don't, I, I don't believe so. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about with the fire engine. We're not buying a new fire engine. Oh. Fire <laughs> well, engine. <laughs> I'll, I'll go into it with you uh, in, in one of these days. Uh, I mean, I, it, it's certainly a t it's certainly the talk among uh, people in the fire department. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, anything else? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, well, that's what I'm going to move yeah. that we vote on. Um, also, we've already had a public hearing on the budget, so we're going to move um, right to voting. Um, so um, all those in favor of approving the budget that has been presented to us by the town administrator, uh, Bernard. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, aye. <laughs> all right. <laughs> John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. Uh, and it's an aye for me as well. All right. Um, Thank you. Thanks on that, Melissa. Um, we have uh, two more, and then we... Um, Geez, we should have done this appointment much earlier. But anyway, then we have a appointment for the Small Business Development Committee, which I think will not be controversial at all. Uh, and, uh, and I mean that. Uh, so um, we're in Article 25 on single-use plastic. Uh, is, um, is everybody clear where they are on this or have any questions? We do have the petitioner here if you have questions. Um, are, there, are there any um, – I guess the only question I would have, Clint, is are there any updates and since we heard from you last and you know any agreements that have been made, those kinds of things? Yeah, I, yep. I, hi, Clint Richmond again, town meeting member, precinct six. So the advisory committee voted unanimously to support Warren Article 22, uh, 25, but they made some amendments which we, the petitioners, are amenable to. Okay. 
So they, uh, and I sent uh, to Ms. Fields the, uh, the revised text if you want to bring it up. There's only deletions. So, you know, there were like seven categories and now there are like four or, you know, three. So it's sort of, we just, we just trimmed it. And that was partly as a result of the same conversation we had on 22 with uh, uh, Department of Public Health in Seagal. Uh, we may trim further, <laughs> but for tonight, the, although, and, and again, I'm hoping that you'll give them more staff, but um, that uh, the text is, if you scroll down to the first, it's, there's not much text, it's only one page. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see the, uh, you might have to enlarge it. Um, there's the section, oops, oops, go back up. So it took out the microbeads, which affected three sections, but the, the, if you can enlarge the list there, right in the middle where it says restrictions, can you zoom in? And now scroll down. And, no, this is 25. They look similar. Um, so uh, if you look at that, you can see that we have that advisory committee, and they took votes, eliminated number two, they eliminated microbeads out of number three, and they eliminated number four. But then they voted, I think it was 20 or 22 to zero to two. Okay. I, um, I have the vote here. I can, I all right, no, this, or maybe, maybe, maybe you've got it in your packet, but so well, I, I thought that was very positive. Again, I enjoyed working with DPH and, um, I guess that rest is up to you now. All right. Any issues or questions before we vote? <laughs> well, you could always use them, but if you didn't litter them, we wouldn't be having this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen it with the shaving cream kind of side by side. <laughs> That's right. We sure have. All right. <laughs> Uh, you know, love a good compromise. Um, let's, um, we've got agreement here and a uh, happy petitioner <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm happy to move this. Um, no issues. Okay. So I'm going to move uh, favorable action on one article 25 single use plastic. Uh, all those in favor, Bernard. Uh, aye. With, with, with the amendment. Well, as right. amended by the advisory as committee. A, as sorry, amended as amended by the advisory committee. Thank you. Um, Bernard says aye. John? Aye. Miriam? Aye. And it's an aye for me, too. Thank you. Thank you. That was quick. Um, last uh, Warren article we have before us is Warren article, Warren article 26, the Park and Rec Commission. Again, we had a public hearing on this uh, previously. Uh, it's the petitioner. Um, is no longer with us, no longer with us. Uh, and we do not have Melissa either. Uh, I'm wondering if we're aware of, well, I guess I don't really have anyone to ask, do I, of any updates since we've last discussed this article. Maybe if we, if we don't know, maybe it makes sense to put this off until, until we do. Is this article even being moved? Um, I thought we, okay, we don't know. We don't have info. Okay, well. I, I haven't heard that it's not. The recreation director has made a few attempts to get updated language and we just don't have it. Okay. So um, it seems like we're going to need to, well, the board is going to need to weigh in, the, weigh in on this uh, at a future date. So um, that's what we'll do. All right. That brings us to our last uh, business. This is boards and commissions appointments. Um, we have just one uh, for the small business um, development committee. Um, uh, this is a question of appointing um, Ailish Gilligan um, to the committee for a term expiring in August 2023. Board members remember uh, Ailish is the um, is the owner uh, of, of Public House, a place that I love uh, in Brookline, Washington Square. Um, and, uh, you know, I would say as the outgoing uh, chair of the Small Business Development Committee, I think will be an absolutely wonderful addition to that committee. So, um, if there's any discussion, I don't imagine I'm going to move approval uh, for appointing Ailish Gilligan to the SBDC for a term expiring in August 2023. Bernard. Aye. John. Aye. Miriam. Aye. And I say aye. <laughs> um, pleased to have that be my last order of business on this board. Um, uh, good luck to you, um, Ailish, and uh, to the Small Business Development Committee. Um, and thanks, everybody, for a great meeting. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.